it's ooh it's 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 Q and A Friday. Q Q Q Q Q and A Friday. Okay, I'll keep working on it. Eventually, I'll get a good jingle. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hello. It's me again. <laughs> me and Vin- <laughs> Vinny. Vinny. Oh, wow. He's just been barking. Screaming at the top of his lungs. Because there was something outside and he's still listening, aren't you? Come here and give me a cuddle. He's listening to every single sound. And it's difficult, really, because... I can either have the window closed or the door closed. I can't have both. So hopefully I'm blocking off the sounds of the hallway outside my front door where, you know, people are kind of coming and going inside their flats, which they should be allowed to do without hearing him screaming. But the window being open means that if anyone does anything, if a snail farts in the garden, that will start him off. Any little thing. And he's still listening. Vinny, stop listening for things. Give me cuddles. Come on. Come, come, give cuddles. Come, come and chill out. Come and relax. Come on, Vinny, Vin. Come on, Vindaloo. Come on. Ah. <sighs> So yeah, it's Q&A Friday. It is Friday the 15th of November, 2024. It's two minutes past five. My website is jasonnewland.com and please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. This recording will be available in six varieties, six different flavors, one without music, five hours and ten hours without music, one with music, and five and ten hours with music. And what I do now is I will make I make a page on my website and I embed them into the website. Each recording. I also have a link to the, directly to the page to the podcast itself online and I also have an instant download link for each individual recording so that's something I started doing today and I will do another version of this this for yesterday's one and I'll do the same tomorrow morning for this one so I will yeah I'll upload this in the morning I say in the morning hmm I don't know because it's quite a busy weekend. The boxing starts at, I think, 2 o'clock in the morning, tomorrow morning, so I need to be up to watch that. That's on Netflix. It's the Tyson against Jake Paul, Mike Tyson against Jake Paul. It's free as well. Well, it's not free, but if you're a you if you're a Netflix member, it doesn't cost anything. And then tomorrow at five PM there is a Saudi Arabia Latin night of boxing, which is I think there's a couple of world title fights. That starts at five PM. So tomorrow is going to be the next yeah, and that'll probably go on until like midnight or something so it's not going to be a lot of time to do much other than watch boxing I'll put myself through it, I'll suffer through it, I'll be alright I will be okay and if you'd like to support me, you welcome please, you can uh, send me a PayPal gift the link is on the website. Uh, thank you all. Um, what else? Um, 
Yeah, I've got on my website. If you go to the page which just says podcasts, click on there, and that shows you all the podcasts I've got, including the podcast I have, which is just for music, just for recordings with music, background music. All the rest are without music. And I have a Facebook group, Jason Newland's Boring Group. Please join if you'd like to contribute to the questions for Q&A Friday. It's a good place to be. And this Friday, or today, and well, I posted it on Wednesday, any, any questions for Q&A Friday this week. And I've had more response this week than I've had for ages. So I'm going to have a look and go through it. No. If you're going to bark, Vinny, you're going to have to go into the bedroom. And I don't think you want to go into the bedroom, do you? I don't think you do. Why would you want to go into the bedroom and have that big double bed all to yourself? Not really a punishment, is it, to be fair? Although it's not supposed to be a punishment, it's just supposed to be a way for me not to have you barking oh right he was just barking there if he's going to keep doing that he will go into the bedroom I hope he doesn't because I like it I do I like having him here with me but I can't be putting up with that so I've got quite a few questions I've got lots of questions to get through. don't know how I'm going to get through them all. And there's 18 comments on that one. There's another question separate. And then there's another question separate to that, which is on... I don't know where it is. Blimey. It's on... Where is it? Oh, I know where it is. It's on Instagram. Now, I don't normally really check on Instagram, so luckily I saw it. It's uh, Shana. So I'm going to do this question first. I'm going to do Shana first and just go through the... Yeah, because otherwise... if I don't know, Shana, if you're on Facebook, if you can... If you can add the question on Facebook next time, no, not I'm not moaning. I just I don't want to miss the questions. You see what I mean? And I don't go on um, Instagram too often because people don't seem to be doesn't seem to be a very good place to post stuff necessarily. Uh, but I, I, I saw your message, so I shall answer your question first. Uh, is Shana asks if it's not a personal question i was wondering why you were in the children's home when you were a little boy what happened in your life to end up there again if too personal i understand no i don't mind going through it it's um i mean for me it is i probably i probably have talked about it before Probably. What am I doing? I'm clicking, pressing buttons. Okay. I probably have mentioned it, but I'm not sure. I might not have done. I think I have. The honest truth is... I guess you don't really need to have... Need honest and truth in one sentence, do you? But the non-lie is... I don't know 100% why... Or how I ended up there. Or in fact how long I was there. Because in my memory. Bearing in mind I was little. It felt like I was there for a long time. But I don't think I was. And the I was at the children's home in South End, But I was told that they moved us. To Southend because that was closer to where my dad lived. 
I was told that after the event. I think my stepmom told me, like later on, in you know, when I was older. Because we lived in Newcastle, so we was in a, uh, a Nazareth house, which is a, I guess it's orphanage, isn't it? It's an orphanage run by Catholic nuns. And we was in Newcastle one to start with. And then we went to, we moved to South End. And I remember the journey because my social worker, I've had two social workers in my lifetime. One as a child and one as an adult. It's weird, isn't it? My last one was when I had, uh, I was seeing a social worker when I was, had my, when I was diagnosed with bipolar the second time. And, yeah. It was quite nice to actually have some help. The problem is, eventually, they, I mean, they don't have any choice, but they just say goodbye and that's it. And leave you on your own, or leave me on my own. And it'd be nice to be able to have a bit more support sometimes, but... Anyway, that's not, that wasn't the question, was it? I'm just moaning. I'm moaning. I remember the journey from Newcastle to South End on the train. Because it was a long journey. It's quite a distance. And my social worker, Mr. Wright. I'm guessing it's spelled W-R-I-G-H-T. He was lovely. But I don't know, I don't remember being with anyone else. I just remember going up with him. Just me and him. I don't recall my other brothers being with me. And they were both with me at both of the children's homes. My Both my older brothers. They were both older, they, they were older than me when I was born. And I don't know... I mean, maybe we did all travel up together, but I don't think we did, which doesn't make sense to me. Unless they went first to kind of settle in, and then I really don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I do remember my first day at South End Children's Home. There's a, sp a specific thing happened that has just stayed in my mind. So we travel all the way from Newcastle. Let me see, how long would that last? I mean, it's probably quicker now than it, than it used to be back then. But say Newcastle to South End by train. You're looking at, wow, yeah, it's oh, it's not that bad not a huge journey it's like about five hours about roughly five hours so it's that's a heck of a journey for a, a six-year-old that's a long journey isn't it but I was yeah so five hours and let me just have a look see Newcastle Nazareth house I have looked this up in the past. Wow. Sandyford House. Tyne and Ware. That's where it was. Tyne and Ware. The house was originally called Villa Real and later Nazareth House. A local has bought their dream home overlooking the ocean in Merwevy. Merwever? For more than 11 million. No, it can't be that. That's a different thing. That's the most expensive house in Newcastle. Let's have a look at this. Sandy House. So it's now called Sandy House. It was Villa Real. Then it was Nazareth House. So it's in Sandiford, wherever that is. And Sandiford, Newcastle, District Newcastle. 
class domestic broad house. The house was originally called Villa Real, and later Nazareth House was built by John Dobson in 1817. The main front had large bow windows and the Tusk, Tuscan columns supported the entrance porch. I just want to see if it's... Right. So it was owned by Dr. Gribb, a surgeon. But when he passed away in 1916, the property was owned by the poor sisters of Nazareth for nearly 80 years and was known as Nazareth House. 80 years, blimey. In 1996, the sisters transferred to London and for a while the house was managed by Catholic Care North East. I wonder if there's any, it says how many rooms there was. Any pictures? Any pictures? I'd like to see that. So that's where I lived. I don't know. I really don't know. Kind of. Oh, blimey. It's not the right place to talk about it here. But if you want to find out more about Nazareth House... And get more, get an idea. It's not funny at all, but get an idea um, what it was all about. Go online. Not not now. Do it during the day when you. But I mean, you don't even do it if it's if you. It's not a nice read, to be fair. But the history and all through the like forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, it was a pretty awful place. So, I don't necessarily remember anything too bad about the Newcastle one, but the South End one wasn't great. So anyway, I I don't know how I ended up in the Newcastle Nazareth House Children's Home. It was one of two two. I, I just figure it's one of two reasons. One was my mum just put us in there for whatever reason couldn't cope or uh, didn't want us or I don't know whatever the reason was the other reason would be I'm guessing that we were taken away from her via social services again it's guessing it's a guess guessing job because I don't I don't know I haven't spoken to her since I was seven so I don't know I haven't seen her since I was seven so I don't know what I've not had that conversation to find out exactly what happened and no one knows I mean someone I mean I'd really like to get hold of the the documents the social service documents from those years to find out exactly what happened and what was in the case and yeah I mean there's there's a few things I remember living in Newcastle in a tower block and my mum got remarried to a man from Newcastle my biological mother she remarried and we lived with him and her together Bearing in mind what I can remember of those times, i probably guessing we were taken away, taken out of that place, that environment. But I don't know. I'm not hundred percent. I'm not. I'm not even. T- I'm not even one percent because I don't know. It just would be guesswork. I don't have the memory of it. Or maybe I do. It's just locked away, <laughs> hidden. So. I don't really know how I ended up there, but it would have been one of those, that's the only, I suppose the only other reason, maybe if she was ill and she was, and we were, yeah, and she was ill. So we were being looked after temporarily and then it 
maybe she was ill for too long and they decided to and my dad found out where we were or whatever I don't know so I suppose there could be more than two reasons in reality I mean I'm being very very simplistic about it but it seems to me that the two two options really I remember there was uh, see I'd like to talk about it but this isn't really the right place to do that uh, there's a lot of stuff maybe I'll make a, a serious podcast one day or maybe that'll just be have to be stuff that's in my book I, mean, I think I have talked about it in previous podcasts little snippets here and there you know but there's one memory I've got it's a strange memory it's not a bad memory I mean it kind of it's not a positive one but we used to constantly be running away not I mean like my mum and my two brothers and me bags packed suitcases packed or whatever and you know I remember standing on a a platform station you know waiting for a train to turn up in them days there was a, a certain smell they weren't all I don't know it just smelled different maybe I mean there couldn't have been like coal coal trains in the 70s could they but there was a definite smell in the air that I'm pretty sure we still had that kind of smell in the 90s because I remember waiting on a platform and I got that memory back kind of just hit me like oh and maybe that was the exact platform that I'd been standing on when I was you know five it's just hard to know and the two memories I had is one where the I don't know a man anyway in a van was taking us back home after we'd run away like after she'd run away with us and he was saying oh you don't want to run away do you you want to stay with me and and I don't know what I said probably said yes all was about keeping the peace me and I remember that sitting in the back of a van and then there was another time that I remember we was in a police station and we were staying or it was a halfway house I think it was a police station and we stayed in there and we stayed in the bunk beds or something and I don't know why though I mean we were little and I hadn't broken any laws I was too young well not too young but I, I hadn't anyway but we were with her whether she'd got arrested I don't know really don't know but we stayed in this I'm pretty sure it was a police station maybe it was a halfway house but I just remember there being police it's a very vague memory so yeah I don't really know how I ended up there I know more about what happened after than what happened before. Does that make sense? I, I remember what happened once I left South End Nazareth House. The home of the nuns. I know what happened when we left there and my dad saved us basically. But how we ended up in there, I was just a bit too young. There's certain things I remember previous to that. and But there's not a huge amount. There's bits and bobs, flashes here and there. and Not like flashes, like... Ee! Not that kind of flash, but just there were a the few bits and bobs that I remember. And... Yeah. So that's it. It's not a very exciting story. But that's it really that's I don't know exactly how I ended up there but I mean the good thing is I was with my brothers which I mean, it makes a difference 
I mean, my oldest brother, he was off doing his own thing anyway because he was he was too old to sort of hang around with me because I was just tiny, and he was four years older. So he was he was with his friends, but we all lived in the same place. But I think he lived in a different dormitory to me. I think because he was older. I think he did. Maybe I don't know. But it was mixed. It wasn't just a boys' dormitory. It was, well, it was a, I think it was a boys' dormitory, but it was a mixed children's home. So there's girls there as well. And I. There was one memory in where we were told. Well, my, my oldest brother came up to me and my other brother. And he called us under the bed. So we all congregated underneath the bed, like climbed under this bed. I don't understand how we fitted underneath this bed. Bearing in mind my brother was like 11 years old. Seven. Yeah, nearly 11. So he wasn't, and he was tall as well. So I don't know how we fit. I mean, it couldn't, there wouldn't have been a double bed, would there? That wouldn't have made sense. So anyway, we climbed under the bed. Maybe our legs were just stick. well, his legs were sticking out. Mine wouldn't have been, because I was about two inches tall. And he told us that our dad was coming to see us. And... We thought that meant the second husband of my wife, of my wife. <laughs> oh, that was weird. Second husband of my biological mother. And she, we decided, I went along with it, but we decided to... Uh, oh, sorry, it's really hard to say, but we decided to do something so we all got cutlery knives from the cutlery drawer and had one of them in our pockets each or behind our backs we thought it was the bloke you know but it wasn't it was this big bearded man who was my actual real dad and weird it's like really because I was I was I didn't know what to do I was just following along like okay but that was both my older brothers decided they were going to get rid of him but then they saw him and my oldest brother knew him he kind of knew him he hadn't seen him since he was probably six years old but he remembered him see I didn't remember him at all I I, I I was with him for the first six months of my life and then I was in foster care for about a, a year and a half so I don't know why I was in foster care but I was with my other brother but my oldest brother lived with my nan and granddad and my nan said she used to say to me he was like he was her her sixth son not sixth son sixth as in th so she had no not sixth son she had three sons a fourth son and two daughters and a few others so because because he was with her from the age of four and a half till six and a half or seven four and a half five till yeah four and a half till he was six but she was she knew him obviously she knew him from birth so she was very very close to him and what happened is my foster parents Apparently, this is what I was told. She, he wanted, they, they wanted to adopt me and my other brother. 
but they had to get permission from my biological mother, apparently. Well, whether they did or not, they contacted her. Or someone contacted her. Because she came and she got my brother, both my other brothers and me, and took us away. Took us to Newcastle or somewhere, I don't know. My, other, my oldest brother said we lived in Scotland for a while. Yeah. So that's how we ended up there. I mean, she took off when I was about six months old. Not quite sure what happened there. But she, my dad came home. So I was six months. My other brother was two and a half years old. And my oldest brother was four and a half years old, I guess. And we we're all upstairs in the house. All the electricity was off. Gas was off, apparently. This is what I've been told. I mean, could be a pack of lies. <laughs> but my dad came home and we were just all in there. On our own. And he, they were married. Him and her got married. They got, got married in 65. And my brother was born in 66. 1966 and I'm assuming we was in a council house I assume my dad was working and yeah she took off she left didn't see her for a year and a half probably And I don't know how we ended up. Maybe it was just too much for my dad to deal with. It, I've never had a conversation with him about it. But what I did find out from my auntie, who was best friends with my mum, funny enough, that's how my dad got together with her. Because they were at school together. And my dad was, I think he was only like a year older than my aunt. Something like that. Maybe a couple of years and they met he met her through my through his sister and they started dating and then they got married so they were best friends my auntie and her well I found out about five years ago when I was talking to my auntie that her and my uncle my dad's brother as well he they both wanted to they were going to get together and buy a big house because he had some kids, she had a couple of kids and then there was three of us. So what they were going to do, get together and they were going to adopt us and all live in one big huge place together or join in houses or something where that we can and bring, help bring us up and they were going to adopt us and again I don't know where my dad was at this time I'm not really not sure this might have been the period when he just had his car crash so that might be he was in a really serious accident like really serious in I'm not sure how old he was but this might have been around that time that explains why he wasn't around because they didn't know if he was going to survive he got crushed between two lorries he was in a mini and so he wasn't yeah I think they, they were trying to make plans it's all coming together now like a jigsaw puzzle anyway so my auntie and my uncle who, now, who passed away a couple of years ago and they I never got a chance to thank him because I didn't know about it and me and him hardly ever had a conversation he just didn't really talk to me and if I'd known he basically tried to save my life you know what I mean like by adopting me and giving me a good home so I wouldn't have I wouldn't have had to go through all the stuff I went through but 
the social services said no. They said no, you got too many kids. That was that was their final decision. So the idea that that it was going to be like a big, not, I suppose, like a commune, I guess, I don't know. But um, my uncle was very successful as a plumber, and he was very, you know, just like my dad and my other uncle, they all kind of could do everything. Uh, my dad's an electrician, my other uncle's a carpenter, and my other uncle that passed away is a plumber. Uh, and then he became a heating engineer. So they all, they could pretty much build a house if they needed to. But the social services said no. They didn't want us all living together. I mean, maybe my oldest brother might have stayed with my nan and granddad. So it might have just be me and my other brother that they were going to adopt. Because I think, I think my nan and, I think my nan loved having, well, I'm sure my granddad did as well, loved having him there. And she said it was like another, like another son to her. But I did become her favourite grandson. That's what I think. I'm going to keep saying it to myself, whether it's true or not. I, she's one of these people, she loved everyone. She loved everyone. She had a lot of love in her heart. She really did. It was, um, she's a really lovely person. So, yeah, that would have been really weird. Not not bad weird. But you imagine I'd have had such a close relationship with my uncle and aunt. I do get on really well with my auntie. My uncle never had hardly a conversation with him. The other uncle hardly ever really spoken to him. So I would have had a close relationship with all of them. So I'd have seen them, wouldn't I, regularly. Um, I literally would have been growing up with them. The, I'd my, I had my cousins that I'd have had a really close relationship with although I'd, I get on really well with one of my cousins my auntie's daughter so one of them I get on really well with and we used to see them quite regularly when we moved back in with my dad went in like when I was seven we used to see my auntie and her kids didn't see my other uncle's so often I don't even remember what their kids names are it's really it's kind of weird but they're all cool they're very tall very tall both my uncles were tall well are tall one was tall one is tall and their kids are even taller they're like 6'6 six, six. it's just and here's me look at me I'm like 5 foot 2 it's not fair yeah so that that that's kind of a weird one that's kind of how that all worked is i realized i told the story back to front a little bit bit flippy floppy but yeah yeah i mean it's quite weird it's, it's amazing that my dad got through what he got through because he was told his, his parents were told that he wasn't going to survive then it was well he might survive but he's never going to he's never going to be able to do anything he's going to be pretty much just in a hospital bed for the rest of his life and then they said well he's, he's going to recover but he's never going to walk again and they changed that. I think he was in the hospital for months and months and months. And they said, "Oh, he's gonna, he's gonna survive. He's gonna walk again." Well, he proved he could walk, and but he's never gonna work again. And he he defied all the odds. I mean, honestly, I think he had a broken back and a broken neck. How he survived that and multiple. It's like uh, awful. So, but I was I was too young. I wasn't around to see to really know what was going on. But and he survived it. It's amazing. It just shows you what human beings. And this is the seventies. This is like the early seventies. Technology wasn't great back then. 
is, and I've seen, I know someone that had a broken back, and what they went through, and they were in hospital for about six to eight weeks, and the bed, gradually they moved the bed up a little bit every few days or whatever, just in order to kind of get the back working. It was, I used to visit him. He, was, he lived in the same house as what I lived in, this bloke, so, yeah. Mind you, I think part of the reason his, his, his back went, well, it's not the reason, but he had osteoporosis, which meant his bones were not very strong, which might have been why he ended up, because he got mugged, so that might be what happened. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's kind of how I got there. Probably not a happy story. I'm not sure. I forget if. <laughs> but Shana, thanks for the uh, questions. I I try and answer every question. So that I get. So what happened in my life to get there? It, I suppose really just my mum leaving, then coming back, and taking us, because. Someone told my mum that I was, me and my brother were going to get adopted. And for some reason, my biological mother didn't want that to happen. So she came and swooped in and took us all. And disappeared into the mist. The Newcastle mist. And back then, we didn't have social media. We didn't have... It was. It wasn't. Obviously, it was the seventies, but it just wasn't. You could hide quite easily the other side of the country. Now it'd be. You know, there wasn't cameras everywhere. I mean, you know, it's just. It's. It was difficult to find someone. I guess. So my my dad didn't know where where he was, but he was clearly looking for us because you know he had a social worker and he's involved with the social services because they wouldn't have just contacted him randomly because they would you know there must have been a reason for them to know where he was. Yeah, so that's it really. That was a happy story. <laughs> La da 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 da. We wish you a merry Christmas. We wish you a merry Christmas. Oh, right. So let's have a look. Where are we going? Facebook. My group. So I want to answer Ben's question next. Uh Okay. Q. And a question, this is Ben. Do you think you're going to stick at the course or you're just not in the right mindset for that such, uh, such, such a big challenge? Also, do you know how Logie got on? And final question, did that lady ever sort, sort you back? All right, yeah. Did I ever get the money back for the kitchen items? And are you still friends? No, it's a bit personal, um, but I like to know people aren't taking Nimic with such a nice bloke. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'll answer the last question first. No. It's, it's a neighbour, so I can't. I'm not, like, not friends, but I'm not, you know. She still asks for stuff, but hasn't asked for any money for a while and won't get anything from me and I go back did she pay anything no not a penny not even not even broached the subject I mean, I, I, neither have hired to be honest so you know yeah I, I think I just have to accept that it was I was very I was in a very vulnerable situation and I was just, because I got the stuff on the catalogue so it's not like I paid 
obviously I'm still I'm still paying for it now but it was kind of free and I was going through a bit of I think I'm going through a bit of a manic period and she just moved in she didn't have anything and she just see if she had moved into a different flat I probably wouldn't have even talked to her I would to say hello but she was in my friend's flat and the one that passed away so I just had this connection with that flat I mean in and out of there for the last 10 years nearly so for her to be in there and not have anything not not have a fridge not have anything at all so and she asked me about I don't know what she asked me for if there's any does she know any uh fridges second hand fridges going for sale or anything like that and I just thought you know what I'll just get her a fridge and she didn't even have a cooker she she literally had just an empty flat didn't have anything she had a bed so she had something she had a bed in fact I don't think she even had a bed I think she was sleeping on the sofa or did she have a bed I think she might have had a bed but she didn't have a cooker, didn't have a microwave, didn't have a fridge or freezer, didn't have a toaster, didn't even have a kettle. So I just ordered all that stuff for her. So in a way I can't really ask for the money for that back because she didn't ask for it. I just got I just gave it to her. I ordered it thinking it'd just be a nice thing to do. And because I got carried away, she seemed like a nice person and I wanted to help her. And I was kind of primed to help the person that lived in that flat. I just, I don't know. I'm trying to think of excuses, but it's just what happened. That's what happened. So I, I ordered all this stuff online on the catalogue. And then... So that came through. So yeah, so I got a cooker, fridge freezer. It's all stuff that's better than what I've got in my own flat, funny enough. And then I got uh, a microwave for her, a toaster and a kettle. And then she asked for a television. So I got her a television. And then she asked for a sofa and I didn't get her a sofa. I was looking, but so at this point I'd spent with money I'd lent her probably about a thousand, over a thousand pound. So the only thing I could ask for back from her would be the money that she said she was going to give back to me which she never did and the money for the TV she said she was going to give me the money for the TV I mean she did say she was going to give me the money for everything I got but you know that if that went to court I wouldn't stand a hope because I got it for her she didn't ask for it and you know morally she's in she doesn't need to pay that back really because i got it for her don't be barking Vinny. really think twice think twice before you do that but for the tv yeah and so i'm never going to see any of that so i think i've just i just accepted that i was I was taking for a ride, that's pretty certain, but at the same time, I put myself into that situation. Therefore, it doesn't really matter anymore. I'm still paying off, it's going to take me till, I think, March 2028, before I've paid off everything. I still owed money, I still owed about, are you going to calm down, Vin? Seriously, I don't know what's wrong with this dog. 
he just can't stop it like he has to bark. Huh, 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 huh. What? Calm down. There's nothing of interest out in the garden or in this building. Only me and you, we're the only interesting things here. Yes. <laughs> So yeah, it's just, it's just one of those things. So I still owe about a £1,000 for my laptop, which I bought a couple of years ago. But then there's the other money on top, so it's going to take me till the 20, 2028 before that's all paid off. Yeah, so that I'm answering these questions quite quickly, aren't I? So that was that. It's just, it just is what it is, really. It's one of those. I was vulnerable and I kind of, in some ways, took advantage of myself in a way, if that makes sense. I just, I got carried away trying to help her. And in reality, I probably would have done it for anyone. But I also, yeah, I don't know, there's more. It doesn't matter anymore. Don't matter. Uh, so, Logie, good news about Logie, he has a new home. I'm going to say he's happy because I know he is. It, you know, the, the RSPCA, they don't, they're very, very, very uh, strict and careful about who they rehome a dog to and they'll they'll hold on to a dog for ages before you know until they find someone so i'm pretty certain that he's a very happy dog and he's enjoying his retirement that's what i reckon i don't know where he's living it might be weird one day i might see him might be in town and suddenly this this cute face looks at me. He's going to remember me, I guess. He's known me for a long time. But yeah, he's, he's happy. So he's uh, he was in there for quite a while. But now he's got a new home. So it's a, it's a happy ending, really. I mean, it's been nearly a year since he was orphaned, as it were. Uh, I had him for the first two months. So I had him from November 24th until the end of January. He went and he, his new home was with uh, one of my friend's friends. She took him and I thought that would be it. And then I found out in the summer, I think it was, that he was in the RSPCA shelter. So I've got no idea how he got there. Knowing him, he probably escaped. He was an escape artist. He loved running away. He was never happier than when he was in the field just doing his own thing. Trotting along like a horse. Just doing his own he didn't he didn't like being restricted. And my friend used to think that maybe he had a girlfriend somewhere. He'd go and visit her. Cause he used to come home and just plop down on, on the floor. He could let himself in as well. He could like, put the handle down and, and let himself in. <laughs> Bless him. Hey, how are you doing? What? 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 <laughs> yeah? Vinny just growled at me. Calm yourself down, Vin. Oh, I just... Where is it? I've just come out of it. New post likes. 27 minutes. Was there any other questions to... Oh, okay. The course... It's a weird one. It's a weird one. 
because I've not done anything towards the course. See, I know that I can do, I can do the TMA, which is the tutored mark assignment. I could do it, and I can pass it. Yeah, I know that a hundred percent. It's just. And the thing is, I'm, I am interested in psychology. I, I listen to audiobooks on the subject. Uh, maybe I'm more interested in the more advanced stuff, perhaps. That's what it is. I mean, it's a developmental side. It's interesting, but it's... It's... Mm, it's like... There's a lot goes on between impregnation and birth, right? Huge amounts goes on. I'm not talking from a psychological perspective, although there would be, but just, you know, there's a huge amount goes on inside a, a, a mummy's tummy going from, you know, impre from, from the, the squirt to the birth. So, but I've got no interest in that whole process. I was, I used to be interested in the first bit, but nowadays, you know, I just, I'm interested in what happens when they're born and, you know, going from there. But in the same way, I'm interested in how the brain works. I'm not hugely interested in the developmental side as much as the the social side maybe the why someone is like they are uh, the I'm trying to I'm not probably explaining it very well but in order for me to progress I need to do the course so what I'm going to do is I won't be doing it tomorrow because it's boxing weekend. Sunday, I'll I'll get on it and try and sort of figure out what to do. That's what I'm going to do. Maybe even put together all the coursework so I can listen to it in bed. But then I like to listen to the radio in bed on a Friday night. How on earth am I going to get up? I mean, literally, it's nearly time. If I'm going to get up at two, it's six o'clock now. So I need to be going to bed about eight to get up at two. How am I going to do that? Ah, ow. And because it's live, I don't know if they'll... Will they allow playback? I don't know. If they do allow playback, I could get up at 7 or 6 in the morning and just watch it. But how do I know? Uh, perhaps I could look into it. So yeah, I don't know. It is a, it's a big challenge. I think one of the problems I've been making is thinking of it like a six-year thing. And realistically, I don't even know if I'm going to be around in six years. I'm 54. I don't know what's going to happen. And, but on the other side, I'm thinking, doing something that is stimulating my brain is so important. And the more I go down the road of education like the more books I read the more stuff I learn the more I move away from the idea that I am really dumb and that's what I used to think about myself because that's what I was told I was dumb I was backwards I was behind I was stupid blah blah all that you know I was a dunce that, that's what I was told and that was just for me teachers so it is didn't have a lot of self-confidence. Well, I had none. I had a little bit of confidence when I started doing karate. But not in my mental ability. 
and I'm starting, even when I did the degree before, the first degree I did, it was, I put very little effort into the actual academic side. I just know, I'm just thinking, to complete this would give me maybe a bit of closure on the idea that that I'm super dumb, you know, that I'm really unintelligent. If I can do a degree, a proper academic degree, the other degree was proper, it's just this is, there's a lot of practical to it as well. This is all academic. So I think completing this course, I would, I mean, who knows, six years time, blimey. I know six years goes quickly, I'm aware of that. You know, I'll be 60 before I know it, and it's, well, not before I know it, I probably will know it, hopefully I will know it. But how many people do you think who's listening to this now that I haven't angered <laughs> during this recording how many people do you think was, how many of you do you think will still be listening to me making these recordings in six years time you may, it's just weird isn't it when you think about it I've been doing this for this let me bore you to sleep since the beginning of 2018 What's that? 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25. Nearly seven years. Well, it'll be seven years and about three months. So add another five years onto that. Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. That's over nine years. So I'll have been doing this recording for over a decade. This this podcast, this one podcast. And we'll all be getting old together. Together. Yeah. Strange one. Me and Vinny. I'll be 60. Vinny will be about 90. How old will Vinny be? He's seven years per year, isn't it? So six years times by seven. So seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-two, plus forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight. 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56. He'll be about 60 as well. It'll be roughly 60. So when I'm 60, he'll have reached my age in his years. He'll be 6, 7, 8, 8 or 9 years old, I suppose, by then. Wow. I wonder if he'll be a bit more chilled out by then I wonder if you'll be more relaxed a bit less barky a bit less yappy a bit less reactive maybe I'll be a bit less reactive and a bit less yappy and a bit less barky Avin so in answer to your question Ben I'm not sure I intend to do it. I feel quite positive about it. I just I have to do it. I almost wish that it wasn't starting until February. Which I could have done. I could have started it in February instead of October. And but then it's like anything like oh I'm very much procrastination is something that I do I'm very good at yeah 
And then I think I might do a maths degree. What do you reckon? <laughs> Count on your fingers, okay? For maths. It's kind of ironic, isn't it? Is that ironic? Or just silly? Me talking about how I now know that I'm actually intelligent and then I start counting on my fingers. So, these are the rest of the questions that I've got. There's quite a few. Barry asks... Drawing pins or blue tack? Uh, I did answer that question saying, I wonder how long it would take me to answer this one. And I got an answer from Barry saying that that was what I was thinking. Um, well, you know what? It's quite a simple one to answer, I think. Let's have a quick drink of water. I would say... Well, I do have an answer. It's blue tack. And if you looked at my walls, you could see that. Because there's... There's blue tack everywhere. I think the problem with drawing pins is... They're not always easy to put in. I mean, they're good for, like, those oak... What do they call them? You know, those boards where you can... They're almost like cork boards, and you, you can, like, notice boards. I'd, I'd like to get some of those. The so drawing pins are quite good for that. I used to use drawing pins in the door, my living room door, for appointments. Now I use blue tack, and I've got quite a few packets of blue tack still. So if I've got a doctor's appointment or a dentist appointment or uh, someone's coming round or whatever, I put it on the door. Because I had that door open most of the time. Although the last couple of days I've been closing it during the day as well with the window open to try and stop Finny from barking because he's been a little bit, a little bit too barky recently. It goes through periods. So I answered that quite quickly. I'm pretty pleased. Although they do have a tendency of pulling the paint off. If you leave them on too long. The blue tack. I actually put blue tack over the knocker on my door. Which is a sign just saying leave, leave parcels on the floor. But I put it over, over the knocker. Because a neighbour almost knocked the door down, banging on the knocker. So I put this piece of paper over the knocker. The next day, bang, bang, bang on the knocker. She literally pulled the paper down to use the knocker. And I think I might have been reactive. In fact, I was. I, but anyway, what I did after she left is... I felt I must have used like a whole packet of blue tech and I you can't get the thing off now. You, the doors needs to be you'd have to actually remove the whole door if you want that sign off. It's stuck. So much blue tech used and no one can ever use that knocker again. I don't want people using the knocker. Why why what's the point of having something like that in a little flat? I understand it if you're in a mansion. If you're in a mansion, you need a big door knocker. You know, I'm not knocking a big a big knocker. I mean, you might even need a pair of knockers in a in a mansion. Sometimes they have like two knockers that are like connected together. But I don't I don't need that here. Besides, I've got my doorbell here. Anyone even Enters the building, Finney starts barking. Ah, <sighs> so Brittany, hi Brittany, asks me what was the best date you've ever had? Details, details, details. The best date I've ever had. Ah. Uh, 
It's a long time ago. Um, I had less grey hair. I don't know. I'm not sure if I've ever, ever had a really good date. Sure, I must have done. Um, I mean, I've not. None of them have been bad. Well, well, some of them have been bad, but generally. Best date. I mean, in a way, probably my best date was when I was eight. I talked about it a few weeks ago. Um, I don't know why I remember it. It was, I feel like, the first date I ever had. And I went round. I don't know if I went round her house or we went, I met her at the cinema. But we went to the cinema anyway, watched two movies, the matinee, matinee show. And then went back to her house. I took a flower. No, I took a, a box of chocolates. And then I went back to her house. We had some chips. And we had a kiss under the table. I peck on the cheek, probably. But, yeah. So I don't remember it, but I kind of got fond feelings about it. It's just that I remember waking up and giving my dad a massive hug. So he woke me up to get up. So that's why you would wake someone up, isn't it? But he wouldn't normally wake me up on a Saturday. But I did ask to be woken up. Specifically because I had this date. And I was so excited. And... I'm not sure if I've had any exciting dates. I might have done. I just can't really... Remember any good dates? What's my best date? That's the question, isn't it? Best date I've ever had. It's not happened yet. Not happened yet. Um, no, nothing really stands out. I think the problem is I never really, never really dated the person I wanted to date. I dated people I wanted to date, but I just didn't, there was never, it was never really hugely exciting. It sounds bad, doesn't it? But. I think it's because quite often I'd get to know the person first. So it wasn't as it, like meeting someone for the first time, asking them out and then going out, meeting them in a pub or in a, a, going to a restaurant or to the cinema and not knowing anything about them. You know, I haven't really done that too often. I did it in Ireland. I met someone, and that was the situation. Met her to have a drink, and then we went. I think we went to the cinema and stuff. That was all right. Um, no, I can't remember uh, anything that was particularly memorable. Otherwise, I'd remember it, I guess. I'm not saying that there wasn't anything memorable happening. Yeah. yeah, it hasn't happened yet. Should we say that? Is that a, it's a bit of a cop out, but yeah. Hmm. I don't know. I mean, all, all the dates have been nice, I guess. It's, I've, well, not all that, oh, blimey. Not all. I've had a few just, 
yeah, just some pretty awful ones actually. It just, it, it, like it just, it was just wrong. I remember years ago there was someone that I I got on really well with her on the phone, and she was a customer, and she came in and and I met her and us, and we decided to have it in a, a meal in the evening in the club, and we did and. I just wanted her to go. I just, it wasn't. It was like she was picking on me, um, just picking apart everything I was saying and really, it or making fun of me. I don't know what it was, but yeah, I didn't enjoy that that date. And she wouldn't leave. And she's like, then she just kept staying. Is he said, well. I need you to walk me to the train station. I said, oh. But she she insisted, so I did. Walk to the sort of train station and made sure she got on a train or she got a taxi, I think, in the end. But she just, it's almost like she didn't want me to go and I just, I was trying not get rid of her, but I was, I wasn't enjoying myself. But this wasn't about what the worst dates are. So I shouldn't have mentioned that. So I'm trying to think. I can't remember. I've had lots of nice moments. Dates. There weren't so much dates. They were more kind of just meeting up. Um, I mean, a good date would be where I was laughing a lot. But I can't remember doing that. There must have been someone I laughed with. That I went out with. I mean, I've had girlfriends where I never went out with them. I was dating them, but then I actually went out. Not like out out might go out for the day but never actually went to a restaurant or to the cinema or anything like that I had a girlfriend once and we did used to go out and stuff but oh I've got it Probably my best date was in the cinema with my first, not my first girlfriend, but kind of one of my first girlfriends. This is in 1991. And yeah, we made love in the cemetery. It was brilliant. No, I'd, maybe, but I, no, we was, went to the cinema and we watched the, uh, the cable guy he's not weird I remember just remember that we watched the cable guy together that was quite a nice date and we I think we just hung out and went into the west end and actually one of my best dates it wasn't really a date but it ten ended up being a date was someone that I'd met when I was working at the elephant and castle and I just bumped into her when I was visiting my friend a few months later. It's like probably springtime, 92. And we hit it off in a big way. And we spent the entire day together and all evening. And she went home, you know, at the end of the day. At the, when we went, basically we spent eight, we spent, we were t having eating in a restaurant or a diner place and then we went to the comedy club and we just spent the evening I really enjoyed spending time with her I'm not quite sure what happened there she went home and never saw her again she got I think a train home and or the bus home and I went my way she went her way and the problem I had at the time is I wasn't allowed to, not allowed, can you believe that? But I, I wasn't, it wasn't, 
yeah, I wasn't allowed to have people back. So I was paying £40 a week in 91 for a room and I wasn't allowed to have guests, female guests, when I was 20 years old. And the only thing I wanted in life was female guests. That was the most important thing in the world to me at the time, other than comedy. You know, the idea, I just, all I wanted was a girlfriend, I think, really. But I wasn't allowed to have anyone back there. Yeah, it wasn't good. If I could have my time again. So, yeah... I don't really remember any particular spectacular dates. No. I can't think of any. There might have been. I just don't remember any particular ones. I'm sure there were ones, apart from that one when I was eight years old. That was nice. But that was a novelty, because that was like the first date when I was going out. I'd never been to a cinema on my own before. And, you know, there's a lot of firsts on that one. I did date a girl when I was probably 15. Maybe I turned 16, but I think I was probably still 15. She was, I don't know, about the same age. And we went to, that's when I was in a chip shop. We went, I might have been 16, but we went into the Indian takeaway, I think it was. I'd never been in a restaurant before. So I didn't know what to do, so, but we, uh, I didn't know whether to pull the chair out for the lady, to pull it out when she went going to sit down or push it in when she was going to sit down or just push her off. I didn't I didn't know. I didn't know what the etiquette was. And back then there was a degree of etiquette when it came to dating. I don't know if there is any more. I've got no idea. Yeah, I don't remember. Blimey. Yeah, sorry, that's not a very good uh, answer. So when you're looking at a woman's chest, what's the first thing that you notice? No, sorry, I read that wrong. So when you when you see, or are talking to a woman, what's the first thing you notice? Clothing, hair, teeth, TNA, eyes, etc. Now Dimitri asks, I apologise for meddling. But if I may ask, what is TNA? And then in brackets, is it temper and appearance? Well, I'm going to give you the answer, but it's going to be a much more sanitized version. It's um, yeah, it's it's going to be a a much more like family friendly version. So TNA. Stands for teeth and anus. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It does, I don't know. I do know. Um, teeth. I don't know. It depends on each person because some people have. Everyone's got their own unique thing, haven't they? I mean, there's certain things that I would always notice but I, I like facial expressions is a smile the, I know it's just sometimes I know it can be deceiving you can't really judge a person on how they smile but physical appearance it depends I've dated all kinds and it's been a long time since I dated anyone so I've got no idea even if I would 
can't really be fussy at these these days. <laughs> uh, anything, really. No, that sounds bad, doesn't it? As long as when you're talking, straw doesn't fall out of your mouth, I'm happy. No, uh, I, I think... Okay, if I go back in the past, I always like nice eyes. But then I never used to really go for girls with glasses. Now I don't doesn't bother me at all. Just never used to find girls with glasses particularly attractive. And I think that might have been because my mum had glasses and I don't know, I just wasn't wasn't what I wanted. And I always used to be a bit rude about it. Not not to the women, but just generally Dating someone with glasses like dating someone through a window pane. But it's not, is it? Because I wear glasses and I've also dated someone through a window pane. And it's very different. Very different. I mean, glasses are a lot easier to carry around, for one thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I... I'd, I'd, it's lots of different things I like. I mean, I like really pale girl females, but also like dark females. You know, it's 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 not like one thing or another. It just it is. I like red hair. I like dark hair, blonde hair. I'm not bothered. It's about the person, really, and. personality means more now than it ever did and someone that can tolerate me if I could find someone that actually wants to be with me and is willing to put up with me that in itself is a miracle and I haven't yet although I've not been looking and I never hardly go out so the chances of meeting someone is very slim. I uh, don't do dating online or anything like that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Just someone nice. No drama. No drama. No drama. No drama. No drama. That's it. Someone that doesn't have drama. Or doesn't want drama. But physical details. I mean, this thing is, it, it's, it's a bit of a lie, isn't it? If I say, when I meet someone, I don't even notice what they look like. Well, it's not true, is it? It's a lie. If I don't notice what they look like necessarily if I'm just talking to them. But I do notice what someone looks like if I'm attracted to them. Does that make sense? And I'm not attracted to many people. So um, if I'm talking to someone, yeah. But if I'm talking to someone that has really amazing eyes or really amazing smile or a great um, <laughs> set of feet, whatever. It's just like, I notice it. Or if they, I might notice that just like anyone does. But I notice that with men as well. I notice it if I see a man with muscles or um, a sexy beard. You know, I notice it. It doesn't mean that I want to have a relationship with them. But I notice it. Like my dad's got the best beard in the world. I don't want to date him. <laughs> That's not a good example, is it? So yeah, I think I'd probably answer that question if it was just me and you on <laughs> in person. I'd probably answer it a bit more honestly. That's that's terrible, isn't it? That I can't just be honest. There's certain things we've all got things we like, and anyone that says they haven't is, I think, telling fibs. We've all got things that we like. Certain things that do it for you. Some people, it's that and other people it's this and I do like voices not the ones in my head they annoy me I like voices I like 
I'm quite good at remembering voices. So in the dark, if someone says hello to me, I can quite often know who it is. Like when I'm outside with this one, this little Vinny Vinny. And I can see the figure, but I can't see their face. But I can like, okay, I recognize their voice. So I'm quite good with voices. Now, not everyone believes me. Because I remember years ago, I was in the call center. And I said to this person, oh, you, yeah, you, you phoned up a few months ago. And he said, you don't remember me. How can you remember me? You speak to hundreds of people, thousands of people in a month or whatever. I said, yeah, I know, but I just remember your voice. And the customer didn't believe me and my colleagues didn't believe me, but I did remember the voice. So, yeah, I'm quite good at remembering voices. Not faces so much. Perhaps I should start looking at the faces. Some things... Yeah. I mean, I've dated people in the past. All shapes and sizes. Nationalities. It's, yeah, it's... It's all about individual, isn't it? Everyone's different. It's all... Yeah, everyone's different. I mean, I have my type. But my type is a few different varieties of my type. But I try not to have... To be too caught up in my type. Because... It turns out I don't think I'm anyone else's type. So I need to figure that way. I might if if it keep, if I'm single for much longer, I might have to develop some kind of a personality, and maybe use that to to try and get people to like me. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Um, oh yeah, Ken says teeth, temper and appearance, teeth. LOL. So. Um, and what does Dimitri say? Oops, of course, it's none of my business, but I thought you were taking a break from recording videos to concentrate on your studies. Good to know you're back. Okay, I'll answer that in a second. Uh, so, T. So, um, thanks for your question, Brittany. Dimitri, matching... Okay. Dimitri, you're wondering... Yeah, I did, didn't I? I did say last week that I wasn't going to make any recordings after the Q&A Friday last week until December. And I got through the weekend and I did nothing. I mean, I did nothing. Like, literally, I think I just slept, watched TV and slept. And I didn't feel particularly good about it, to be honest. And then Monday all day long, I did nothing. And then I started thinking... I got the urge to make a a boring object, sleepy boring objects recording, you know, for my Monday recording. And I don't know why I was getting that. I was just like, oh, I just want to do that. So I did it. And then I did Tuesday. And then I did Wednesday. And then I did Thursday. Have I done one every week, every day this week, haven't I, I think? Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. I think. I know I did one last night. I did. I know I did a, a Monday. I did Tuesday to Tuesday trivia. And I think I did one Wednesday. I definitely did one last night. So yeah, and uh, Chris said I thought the same thing. See, that's pretty much what happened. I I was going to do that. But as Dimitri says here, his plans sometimes change. Maybe Jason has changed for a little, has changed his, for a little while. Yeah, I just, there's no real kind of reason other than, I didn't see the point in spending the next two weeks doing nothing and then having lost the course and having nothing to show for it so I might as well 
even if I, if for whatever reason I stopped doing the course, at least I've done, made some recordings, I guess. So thank you for that. Um, Anne asks me, if you won the lottery, what is the first thing you would do? Depending on how much it was, but let's face it, it's going to be more than what I've got. I think what I would have to do is take a break. Not from this, but from here. I would go and rent somewhere, uh, I don't know, a cottage or something in Wales or maybe Scotland. I don't know, somewhere in this country probably. Because I've got Vinny, so I can't leave him, so I can't really be going abroad. I go rent, yeah, rent a thing, rent a place for a year. And then figure out what I want to do. So I can do my degree. Maybe I decide I don't want to do the degree because I want to do other things. Who knows? But I would take a year off, or not a year off, but I would take a year to kind of, I'd sit on the money, I wouldn't spend anything to start with. I might, you know, if it was a, a huge amount of money, I'd chuck a few quid to my dad and friends and family, but not huge amounts, just, it depends on what it was, just, just to kind of give them a treat so they could do something. So maybe give my dad, give him some money so we can go on a, uh, I don't know, some kind of uh, holiday or something like that. And I would, I'd probably buy this flat as well, maybe. I don't know, but I, I definitely, what I, my plan, and it's, this is something I've thought about in the past, I would, I, initially, my idea was, I'm going to do this, I'm going to help this person, I'm going to help that person, but what I realise I'll end up doing is giving all the money away, and then ending up, after six months or a year, or two years, three years maybe, and have nothing. And I don't really want to do that because it's an opportunity that I'd be wasting. I would, yeah, so I'd go and stay, rent a cottage somewhere or house, somewhere nice. And I'd spend a year just figuring out what I want to do next I could I'd, I'd take all my equipment with me and I'd be still be doing my recordings from there I'd make sure the rent was paid on this place give the keys to a neighbor so they could check the mail and let anyone in that needs to come in to check the boiler and stuff like that and then I just give it some thought, so I, w I wouldn't like go go completely off the rails. You know, if I, let's say I had a million, I, I won a million pound. I think maybe I'd spend fifty grand in the first year, and leave everything else in in the bank. Or maybe put 800 grand in a high interest account. I'm not really sure, but I definitely would need some space and some time to think about what I was going to do. Because I know, just knowing myself, it'd be easy to get through it very quickly. I, mean, I know a million pounds, a huge amount of money to someone like me and possibly you as well. But the fact is, 
you can spend a million pound in 10 minutes if you go to the right place. There's a lot of things that a million pound, you'd need that just to put deposit on something. You know, it'd be easier. It's, you could buy a house, a million pound would buy you a house in London. Not even a particularly big house, necessarily. And then I'd do that and I wouldn't have any money to cover the costs of the ground rent and the rates and the bills. You know, so it'd just be a pointless, pointless thing. So I'd have to figure a way to make that money last me for the next however many years till I'm, you know, 140 or whatever. So nine, next 93 years. Maybe invest some of it. But yeah, that's what I would do. Um, my initial, My initial answer is give it away give it away give I like the idea of having a big party and inviting my family having it somewhere nice like a in a restaurant but just rent the whole restaurant out so it's just us and invite all members of the family all friends that I care about that's about three people and literally just give them all a present They'll be stuck underneath their chair. And they won't know it's there until I press the button and they all explode. <laughs> no, so I'll just, I'll just be nice, a nice thing to do. Yet at the same time, imagine how much money you could get through. So if I had like 20 or 30 or 50 million, 100 million, well, you know. I could do a lot more. But I think what I'd like to do, something I really enjoyed when I was in Thailand, giving food away, giving cooked food to people who were hungry, that was pretty much my favourite thing that I've ever done in my life. Therefore, I reckon... See, I'm really trying to get rid of the so. So, I reckon... That would probably be one of the first things I'd do if I didn't have Vinny. I'd go travelling. But I can't... I can't leave this little boy on his own. No matter how annoying he is sometimes. Growling at me. So, yeah... Just have to, yeah. I'll take a year. I wouldn't. I wouldn't live like a, a monk for a year, at all. I definitely have some fun, and I would have to, you know, give some money to my dad and maybe my brother or whatever. I don't know, but I wouldn't. Ah. Uh, would I go on a spending spree? I probably would. There's a few things I'd like to have. I mean, if I was going to keep this flat, apart from buying it, it needs to be shelled, completely gutted and rebuilt from the inside out. You know, as far as like the... Just the whole thing needs redoing. A really nice carpet, get the whole place soundproofed. But the reality is, I wouldn't want to live here, I don't think. If I had any kind of money, I wouldn't feel too bad just packing up and leaving and never coming back here again. Yeah, I'll be alright with that. But I don't think I'd do that straight away. So I think that year, just to, just to have some space, some time, to not, it's like, don't go shopping when you're hungry. Don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry. That's the same kind of thing. Don't, it's, don't, 
don't go shopping when you haven't had any money. So if you haven't had any, had any money for a long time, suddenly you've got some money. That's not the right time to go shopping. It's probably the most fun time to go shopping. But it's not necessarily the best time. So yeah, I'd, I think if there was enough money, I'd do both. So I'd have the party, have family and friends, and give them all something. I mean, I, I like the idea of maybe buying them presents, but let them buy their own thing. Give them some cash. Let them do their own thing. So, yeah, even if it was just a few grand each. I mean, if I won, like, a big, 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 big amount, you know, I did the lottery and I won a hundred million, then I'd probably give my dad, like, 500 pound. So that'd be good. That's you now I'd be a bit more generous. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably just chuck him a mill. Isn't it? Chuck them a mill. That's probably what I start calling millions, just a mill. So you got that much. But then you know what? If you got a hundred million, if you had a hundred pound, all you had was a hundred pound in the world, if you dropped a pound on the floor, would you leave it on the floor? You'd, you'd be careful with it, even though it's only a pound. But if you got a hundred of them, like, okay. You drop too many, you're going to end up with none. So although a hundred million is a lot of cash, if you drop too many of those millions, those millies, you end up with less. I like the idea of getting health insurance for everyone. Not in the world, well, that would be nice, but get health insurance to cover my whole family private health insurance so they get instant help no waiting list I'm not really sure how it all works with private insurance but like top notch level so I think that would be quite cool especially for my dad yeah so I'd get the that would be something so I'd probably chuck my dad, he'd get the most amount of money out of my family because he's retired now and so I'd, I'd make sure him and my stepmom were sorted. They're, they're, I think they're quite, they're doing all right, but it'd be, you know, if I could chuck them a million, a milli, then I would, a mil. And then... Yeah, put give some money to my brother, my brothers if I can find them. My stepbrother, stepsister, maybe set up a trust fund for their kids. Or just give them money, let them do it for themselves. I don't need to get involved in that, do I? And... But I think... Other than maybe chucking a few quid towards my nearest and dearest, as they, as they are, kind of, probably chucking a few quid to them, I'd just go away for a while and figure out what to do rather than making any big decisions. Yeah, I mean, maybe if I had a good amount of money, maybe buy buy a cottage in the middle of nowhere. Not in the middle of nowhere, but somewhere nice. Instead of renting, maybe just buy something and live there for a year and then decide what to do next. Me and Vinny. Hmm... I like the idea of starting some kind of soup kitchen. 
uh, free food for people that need it. That that seems like something that would be quite cool. I saw that Bruce Springsteen does that. He's got a couple of soup kitchen restaurants or whatever they call them, and he gives he gives out free food to whoever needs it. Like they come and eat, like cook meals. I thought that was really cool. So that that appeals to me. All right, darling, you right? So again, I've probably not answered it. Uh, this. Right, so that's Anne. Thank you, Anne. Um, Nicole asked me, I'm so happy you're doing Q&A Friday this week. I've been saving these questions in my phone as I was not sure when the next Q&A Friday recording will be. So, number one. Of all the vacations, holidays you have been on in your life, which one was your favourite and why? Hmm. Hmm. I'm probably going to say... Hmm. Hmm. I quite enjoyed going to Torquay. So I spent, I got a bed and breakfast or a hotel or I forget what it was for about three days or four days I was there in the summer in 2002 I think it was, maybe 2003, 2003 it was yeah and that was quite nice. Really nice weather. Yeah, that was good. When I went to Bulgaria, I, I enjoyed parts of it and didn't like other parts. When I went to Amsterdam, yes, some of it was good, but it's the first time I've been away where I actually felt a bit lonely. It's not really a place to go on your own. Amsterdam. I mean, there's things to see. There's also did a bit of window shopping, but it's. I don't know. I felt a bit lonely there. For some reason, I don't generally feel lonely. Uh, yeah. So the, what is that other food? Where did I go? France. That's. Possibly one of my favourite holidays when I went to France. Although it wasn't really a holiday, I was travelling, hitching, hitchhiking and walking through France. And that was in 1989. So I was 18. That was, yeah, that's one of my favourite ones. Um... Spain, well, I only went to Spain for the afternoon, so it wasn't really much of a holiday. But I quite enjoyed the process, apart from the flying part. Belgium. I went to Belgium twice as a kid and once as a older, like 18-year-old. And I enjoyed both, all, all three trips. Mm. Yeah, that was that was all right. I'm trying to think. It's very flat. If you've got any mobility issues, Belgium's a good place to live. It's just it's like really kind of because where I live, like there's always been hills and stuff. It's, it's nice to just be able to to just walk and not have to use any energy and uh, what else I mean literally you could stand on roller skates and hold up a blanket and just wait for the wind what else Bulgaria Amsterdam 
France, Spain. Have I been anywhere else? I mean, Thailand was, again, both those holidays, it's like kind of were, one I broke my rib and the next one I had a chest infection. But my favourite part was giving out the food. And that was during the first one. Yeah, and I gave out, did it over two days. I gave hundreds of meals away. And that was brilliant. Uh, yeah, I loved that. Was my favourite, one of the most favourite things I've ever done. So I guess that holiday, really. Although I was in so much pain from my rib, that it wasn't much fun. Most of the time, but it's that particular moment of giving away food. That was, that was great. Absolutely loved that. And then going around, uh, I got this coffee person who was like a coffee vendor, like street vendor, and had this like a motorbike with this big thing on the side of it, and they'd be making coffees and drinks of people. And because part of the area was being rebuilt, I just got into, we just went up the whole of the road and were giving coffees and drinks to all the workers. So that was a lot of fun as well. And then walking on the beach, I had a an a, had a company a person that accompanied me, showed me around a little bit, and we walked on the beach and gave out all these. I don't know what it is. It, they were kind of like on sticks, food that was cooked. I don't know what it was like, meat and stuff and salad or whatever. But we'd be giving these packets out to people all over the beach. That was cool as well. And the dogs, feeding dogs. Just basically feeding people is just nice. Brilliant, just loved it. I'm trying to think what other holidays I've had. I don't think, I think that's it. I don't think I've had any, any other holidays. No, I can't remember any others. There might have been. France. Isle of Man, that was a holiday, but that was nice, but it was just, yeah. That was 2004, 2005, 2006. Um, it wasn't a holiday, but I did go to on a, on a, um, a retreat. And it was in the summer, and the I was there on my birthday, and they all sung happy birthday, so that was quite a nice moment, to be fair. That was nice. Seven, eight, nine, ten. No, I think that's all holidays. So probably the favourite one would be probably Thailand, as far as it was the most... I don't know, because being ill and having a broken rib wasn't great. But it was, it offered me a great opportunity and experience that I've never had before and always kind of wanted. And I've worked, I've, you know, I've volunteered in a soup kitchen and I've volunteered in the food, the food place in the past. But this was on a different level. It was just, yeah. Absolutely amazing. So I love that. So I'm going to say that holiday. Uh, if you were forced to move out of England entirely, but could choose any other place to live on the planet for free, where would you choose to live? I'd like to travel. I know it's not really answering your question, but I'd like to test places out you know I'd like to go to America I'd like to go to Canada I'd like to go to 
China, I'd like to go to Russia, I'd like to go to Denmark, different parts of uh, Europe. I would like to go to Australia, I'd like to go to New Zealand, I'd like to go to... I think other places, even like Greenland, somewhere like that, it'd be interesting to visit those places. I'm not necessarily a really a big fan of hot, hot countries. Haven't been to one and it's, I don't know if I could really deal with super hot countries. I don't think I've got the right the right um, body for that I don't know not body but just I, I've, I've lived my whole life in a cold country or cool country it gets hot sometimes in the summer every now and then but generally England is not a hot country by any standards compared to the world is it it's not the coldest but it's definitely not hot so to go somewhere that's really warm would be it'd be strange um, maybe living in somewhere like Malta or Portugal I've heard Portugal is a good place to live so I don't have an answer I'm not sure somewhere nice Hmm, you got me thinking. But all this like winning the lottery and where would I like to live, it's got me wanting to move <laughs> and I'm stuck here. So yeah, that that's... I think I quite like the idea of travelling, I'll be honest with you. I like... I don't necessarily want to be a nomad, but it doesn't appall me, the idea of it. As long as I've got, I'm financially okay. And I mean, with Vinny, I'd have, I mean, I could travel to another country and take him with me. Japan is a place that seems like quite a decent place to live. So I kind of, yeah, I'd be interested in maybe living in Japan. Yeah, I'm really not sure. I mean, Thailand possibly, but I'd have to have... There'd have to be a way to keep cool. So the next question is, what exactly is a digestive biscuit? I've heard you talk about them in several of your podcasts now, and we don't have those here in the US. You probably have an equivalent to it, but it's possibly called something different because there's a few things in America that have a different name to what we call them here. Um, digestive biscuit. It's basically, there's two types of biscuit which we use for tea that are well known for like dipping into tea. I mean, some would argue any... Anything is usable for tea, which is true. It could be even chocolate, Ken, if you want. I used to dip Kit Kats into tea. Some would say that's grim. Some would say, oh, mm. So digestive biscuits and rich tea biscuits are the two that are quite well known I mean, you've got hobnobs as well now, as well. But the good thing about these biscuits is you dip them in, providing you don't, it's a certain, it's a certain skill involved. I'm like Liam Neeson. I have a, set, a certain skill set, except mine involves dipping biscuits into tea just long enough so they, they get soggier, but not soggy enough to break. And fall into your tea. Because you never get that back. And you can eat it. And it's all yummy, yum, yum, yum. Especially if you don't have sugar in your tea. 
because it sweetens the tea. So the McVitie's make them, but you can get a home brand. They're kind of like oatmeal. Is it oatmeal? Oatmeal kind of, kind of crunchy. They fall apart, flake. It's, I'm not sure how to explain it, but they're yummy. They're a little bit dry without liquid. You can, if you're being adventurous, you can eat them with cheese on, cheese on top, or even spread jam or marmalade or honey. You know, there's there's different things you can do, but you need to be careful because they do break quite easily. They're they're not the sturdiest things in the world. You wouldn't you wouldn't build a house on one. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Why would you build a house on a biscuit? <laughs> a, that's got to be the most stupid thing I've said for a while. Wow. My favourite is tea. Thanks for so much. I've adored your podcast for years now, but it is really helping me get through some very... Okay. I'm going to read this out because you did post it here. Um, so thank you so much I've adored your podcast for years now but it's really helped me get through some very tough times at the moment I really appreciate all the hard work you do I truly can't put into words how much it helps me each night when I try to shut my mind off or my mind down to fall asleep thank you um, Nicole it's very very kind of you to say those words thank you very much um, oh blimey there's so many questions so many nice things people say thank you so Chris is the next question are you addicted to making recordings <laughs> am I addicted to it I don't I don't know if it's so much making recordings because it might not seem like it but I am doing these in the hope that it's helping people. So you could say I'm addicted to helping people maybe. But if there was no if there was no point. Like if I was doing this in a sense. I know you, you didn't ask me that. I know you, that wasn't what you asked really. Um, but for me it's hopefully I'm helping people. And maybe I'm addicted to that. Or I don't know. I'm not sure really. It's more. This is my. Purpose. This is what I get out of bed for. Not that I was in bed before this. But I mean you know generally. This is what. I look forward to. You know when I go to bed. I look forward to getting up the next day. To get started and to edit the recording and you know things like that so I'm kind of it keeps me going and it's a little bit more structured now than it used to be because when I started in 2006 it was just random recordings here and there and I did loads I did hundreds and hundreds of recordings I lost most of them but I probably had well over a thousand recordings before 2018 and most of them are just either missing or stored away never to be seen again. But in 2018 I started to get more structured a little bit and you know I've stuck to this podcast for nearly seven years. The Let Me Boy to Sleep. There's 2,200 recordings. 2,000 or is it 1,000? 1,200. I don't know. How many recordings are there? It can't be 2,000. 1,234, that's it. Blimey. I added a few there. Oh, oh, now I'm going to have to go back. Okay, got it. All. 
or comments. So Chris, right. I don't think I'm addicted to making recordings, but I am dedicated to it. Does that make sense? I think dedicated rather than addicted. As long as it feels that what I'm doing is worthwhile and has a purpose. Otherwise, there's no point doing it. I think if it was just for my own fun, I'd make the odd video probably. The odd Jason chats, just chatting about what's going on. And I'd do that maybe every few weeks. Maybe every few months. Maybe a few days in a row and then nothing for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. So, yeah, this is... I, I think of it as dedication rather than... Anything else, I think. Uh, thank you for that. So, Ken asks, what your what's your favourite beverage... Favourite beverage, water really, I guess. Yeah, water. Potato crisp or chocolate? These are the real questions. Well, neither, because I don't really eat that stuff anymore. But if I had to choose between the two, and I could eat anything I wanted, chocolate. Chocolate, 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 all the time. But I don't eat chocolate anymore. I have... God, that was loud, wasn't it? I have probably once a week... I might have biscuits or something that has chocolate in it, but I don't actually eat bars of chocolate. And that'll be like once a week, once every two weeks. It's rare. Uh, my, I've got my sugar level way down. Ken then writes, Slippery Little Rattler. So I no idea what that meant. Uh... Tuba without the N. Tuba without the N. What? I got no idea what you're talking about. Slippery little rattler. I don't know what that is. And then tuba without the N. Tuba without the N. Am I being slow here? Possibly. I mean, tuba without the N. Nuba. Buta. Tuna. Buna. I don't know. Uh, the next question. This is all from Ken here. The next one is, the best date I ever had was during the Christmas of 1982. Cool. 1982. That was a good year for music, wasn't it? The old music, the Brits. We got, we dominated the old, the old British bands and singers. We did very well in the early eighties. I loved the eighties, the early eighties music. Um, Joanne asks me, but thanks for the 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 random, <laughs> the random thing there, Ken. A few random bits there. Uh, Joanne asks, "What do you think is going to? Who do you think is going to win, Paul or Tyson?" I would love Mike Tyson to win. I'd love it. I'm going to watch it, and I hope that he does. But unless it's fixed, which it might be, I don't know. It might it it might be like a a wrestling, you know. It might just just they might have been rehearsing it for weeks. And it, it, uh, apparently, Mike Tyson slapped Jake Paul uh, today or yesterday, and Jake Paul just stood there laughing. Now. If Mike Tyson put his full power behind a slap and Jake Paul didn't know it was coming, he very likely, because he didn't block it, so he very likely would have actually been possibly knocked down or at least dazed a bit. 
like if any 15 stone person slaps you like a proper slap not like a just a slap but like a proper um i don't know like put some effort in it's gonna hurt it's gonna stun and it didn't he just laughed it didn't seem to affect him at all so i'm thinking and it was right on his jawline as well so i'm thinking yeah this might just be a wwe moment which will be fun. We've got to think of it as fun. Because the most important thing to me, it might sound weird, but the most important thing is that no one gets hurt. That is always the most important thing, I think, in all sports, regardless of what it is, that no one gets hurt. You know, if we're going to be serious, it's it, but in boxing, it's a bit of a stupid sport. People punching each other. I love it, but it is, I understand it's really ridiculous. And for someone in their, like 50, I mean, he's only a few years older than me, Mike Tyson. And I was 16 when he won the world title and he was 20. So he's only four years older than me. He, I just want him to, I want it to. Be, I think I want it to be fun, and I want him to leave the ring. Fine. If it's a real fight, I think Mike Tyson is going to get knocked down. But because of the situation, I'm pretty certain that the referee will not allow anyone to get hurt. Won't be one of those moments where someone takes lots of punches. The referee won't allow that. Because firstly, it's being shown on Netflix. There's no age limit. People can watch it, you know, of all ages. I would argue Netflix is probably quite a family-friendly platform. And they won't want that attention. They won't want to be shown something that was negative. I'm guessing. I might be wrong. I might be wrong just thinking about some of the stand-up specials they have on there <laughs> so if it's if it's all fair and fair and on the level jake paul is jake paul can just run ring run ring bleh, run rings around mike tyson if he wants to simply because it's as is i'll be able to talk in a minute maybe i've been talking too long his athleticism, his athleticism, he's in his peak. Mike Tyson was in his peak at 20, which was nearly 40 years ago. Jake Paul's in his peak now. And Jake Paul has been training for about five years, pretty much full time as a boxer for five years, four or five years. Mike Tyson's been practicing. He's been uh, preparing for this for, what, six months? No, but what about when he was young? Yeah, he hasn't been in a ring for over 20 years. Not, okay, he was in a, he was in a ring a few years ago with Roy Jones, but like with a proper fight, with a proper preparation and that. So I, I'd love to see Mike Tyson just come in and just tap him and he, and it's over. It's like, and Tyson is the winner. But then I saw something recently online with Mike Tyson saying, when I've done this, I want to, I want to start, uh, I want to make a comeback professionally and I want to take on the world champions. It's just ridiculous. I mean, come on. It, even the worst world champion, the worst heavyweight champion, which I won't say his name, but he's, he got beaten by uh, Anthony Joshua to win the world title, the IBF title. 
is one of the worst heavyweight champions Even he would beat Mike Tyson. <laughs> Charles Martin. Now, no offence to Charles Martin. I mean, he's obviously he's a good fighter and everything, but blimey. Anthony Joshua touched him three times and he went down all three times and it was stopped. It was one of the worst title fights I've ever seen. This is quite a few years ago. And you know how Charles Martin won the world title? His opponent, they were both fighting for the world title, was uh, vacant. His opponent, his opponent twisted his knee, or his ankle, or something, rotary calf, or something, and he couldn't continue. So it's classed as a as a knockout. Yeah, which is ridiculous. They were both unbeaten. Charles Martin was the world champion, the IBF champion, for a few months, and then he lost it to. Andy Joshua and he's come back and he's he's got some wins and he's got some losses the man that got beaten by Charles Martin for the world title because he injured himself he never recovered from that injury he had to retire from boxing I think it was knee I'm not sure but he possibly would have gone on to be one of the greats because he was Really good. But Charles Martin, oh man, he was, he, he wouldn't have won the world title. I mean, he got stopped. He was ahead on points. So technically you could say, well, yeah. Did it work out well? Or just if he quit, he couldn't go on, then they stopped it. I'm not sure. So I'm I'm gonna say Jake Paul's gonna win. It's gonna be interesting to see Tyson, but how many rounds has Tyson got in him? I think it's six two minute rounds. Or is it eight two minute rounds? But the the rounds are two minutes. I remember hearing that. I think it's either six or eight rounds. I don't think Mike Tyson can do six rounds without guessing out. And it's no offence to him. It's just, it's simple physics. His lung capacity, just because of his age, is going to be a lot less. Plus he smokes. He smokes cigars and he smokes weed. Like regularly. So he's not going to have the lung capacity... That he would have if he was a, a fit 57 year old. He might look fit on the outside. But on the inside. He's not as fit as he looks. I mean he looks amazing. His body's. I'm wondering if he's had any help. From the. Uh, the you know. Help. With getting his body like that. I'm not sure what kind of help, but something like that. And I'm wondering. Because he does look particularly amazing. But I wish him well. I hope he's okay. I just don't... I can't see him being able to win at all. Not even not even as a joke. I just don't see it. But I hope he does. So that's my answer to that. Uh, Christine, are you having the traditional pineapple and sweet corn pizza to have when watching the boxing tonight? The answer to that is no. I'll tell you why. Because it doesn't start till early hours in the morning. So, although I can't really afford to get delivery, but even if I could, it they don't deliver that time. I think they stop after 10. So that's a little bit. You know, it'd be quite nice. God, remember the old days? I'd have a sweet corn and pineapple pizza delivered to me from Domino's. I'd have six cans of Coke <laughs> all in the fridge waiting to eat. I'd, I'd have chocolate bars, biscuits, you name it, all waiting to be 
stuck in my mouth while I was watching the boxing. None of that happens anymore. Not one of those. Maybe the pizza sometimes. But, yeah, wow. So that is all the questions. I answered all the questions. I did it. I did it, Dad. I did it. I only went and did it. I don't... Oh, Christine answered the question. Christine, Christine, I don't know. Oh, this was 57 minutes ago, so... Christine sent that message while I was actually making a recording. So that was handy, wasn't it? Oh, I've got another one just coming. Oh no, okay, done. It's all done. I done, did a done, 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 done. So that's all of the questions answered, I do believe. And I'm very pleased with myself. I really am pleased. So, what I would say now is, thank you for listening. I'll probably do my next recording on Monday, which will be the... uh, Sleepy Broiled Objects. If you've got any suggestions for a boring object, or a boring topic, maybe post something. On the group to let me know what you think, what you what your idea is. So now I need to go to a toilet. So thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you deserve to be happy. Lots of love. Bye. See what happens when you when I do this this sound. Oh no! Do you ever need to fart? But then realise you also need to do a wee wee as well, and you don't do both. You don't don't fart in case. I'm just. I've never happened to me, but I'm just wondering. Bye. Uh. Relax. In a more deep and meaningful way. Maybe in a way that can not just allow you to feel calmer now and throughout the time we spend together here. Not just relaxed at the end of the recording when it's finished and you can enjoy that sense of comfort and peace but also I think it would be nice to have those feelings of relaxation continue for longer after the recording is ended so that you can still benefit from listening to my voice maybe in a few hours time perhaps tomorrow And then by listening regularly, especially if you find, like some people do, and myself as well, sometimes I'll find one particular recording that really resonates with me. And I'll just listen to it over and over again, every morning, every evening. There was this recording from, we're going back to about 1999. It 
was uh, it wasn't hypnosis, but it was a guided visualization. So it kind of was hypnosis, really. And I managed to find it again, and it still has the same effect on me. And part of it was the person's voice relaxed me. It just felt so peaceful. And I'd look forward to listening to her in the morning and in the evening. And I knew before even pressing the play button that as soon as I'd done that, pressed the play button, this was in the days of CD players, pressed the play button. In fact, it might have even been a tape, tape recorder. I'd lie down on the bed and then even without necessarily listening to her words because I had them memorized really. It was as if my body knew exactly what to do. And the muscles just almost went into automatic relaxation. And I remember my mind would slow down. Now, now I was, I was listening to this recording in the early days of learning hypnosis. And long before I ever made any videos or audio recordings myself because I didn't start doing that till 2006 but I knew I knew how helpful I found Being able to just let go, to have that trust in the person that I'm listening to. Knowing that it's going to be just as relaxing, if, if not more so. Each time you hear my voice, you may feel the same. Some people have been listening to me for over a decade. Maybe not solidly, obviously not 24 hours a day, but maybe people come back. Some people maybe listen every day. And something that I do which you may not realize by listening is 
is when I record these recordings now, for example, I also am affected by the words that I say. So if I said to you, focus on your feet, notice your feet relaxing, I will be focusing on my feet. I will be noticing my feet relaxing. If I said focus on your hands and maybe notice the difference between each hand. Perhaps notice the, the air in the room, the temperature of the room on the backs of your hands. You may start to notice what almost feels like a very light breeze. Even though there may not be any type of breeze at all where you are right now. And as you become aware of your hands. I'm also aware of how relaxed my hands are feeling now. comes to potentially drifting off to sleep, which may be the reason you're listening. I also feel drowsy when I make these recordings. I also notice my mind drifting. In fact, at times, I've actually fallen asleep. Without even noticing. And then I carry on talking. It's only when I listen back to do the editing. I hear snoring. And I think, I don't remember snoring. I remember talking. Is snoring or is a pig turned up? That's what I sound like when I snore. And I get really into the whole experience. I don't know how you feel. How relaxed you feel in your feet. How relaxed you 
you feel in your hands. I have noticed more and more that the more relaxed, deeper, level of comfort you feel, the easier your breathing becomes. It's almost like that additional muscle relaxation. So this allows you to breathe easier. Without necessarily Focusing on your breath. However, being able to notice the ease in which you breathe so naturally you breathe so very easily and smoothly. Whenever I imagine my breathing improving, when I've got my eyes closed, I tend to Visualize a beautiful field with trees and flowers. Producing all that life-giving oxygen. Feels nice. To, if nothing else, just taking some time away from everything. Enjoying that feeling of peace, serenity. 
reality. With a joyful heart. seems to just drip by so very slowly So deeply peaceful. Completely. Unattached. To any thoughts whatsoever in this moment completely free Noticing that your mind has slowed down. Slowed down. Because nothing really requires your attention. You can enjoy physical sensations of allowing the stress to drip out of your body. Drip in out of every part of your body. And being released from your brain and your mind. So 
slowly but surely the muscles in your legs Pleasant feelings in your arms and shoulders. Deepening each part of your body. Further and deeper and deeper. Noticing the feelings in the back of your neck, Feelings in your wrists, Muscles in the front of your body, are also feeling. Deeply There's a sense of peace Spreads through your very core.
even when you focus on your mind. slower even deep Very slow. Your stomach. Peaceful in your stomach, your back. Notice how relaxed you now feel. Spine from your brain all the way down the middle of your back, sending and receiving millions of messages every day. Deeply relaxed.
spreading those signals down your spinal cord into every part of your body. Shins and your calf muscles. Feelings of peace and tranquility spreading through your body tips of your toes to your eyes your fingers all the way to your lower back. And letting go. Really letting go. Just wandering away. Happy to let go. Let go. Completely. Let go. So tranquil, your whole body. Joy in a sense of letting go. Even more.
Enjoying the space, this space of peace and safety. Letting go. Maybe we can just focus on the different parts of your body. Just to notice Forehead and your eyes. Seeing a sense of 
complete freedom. Absolute freedom. Peaceful energy. of notice. Moving even more deeply in the direction of total. Blissful peace. Blissful peace.
total peace. Letting go. body body feels almost invisible. you could start to notice that you are feeling more relaxed even though I've not purposely focused your mind upon that sense of physical comfort that is growing within you throughout your body and your mind starts to slow down and that could be almost in recognition of I guess my speech not being particularly fast
and things just generally feel calmer just by listening to my voice. You give yourself a, an opportunity to take a break from the day. Take a break from your life as it is. And to give yourself a rest. Giving yourself permission to take some time off and to allow your body to relax and allow your mind to slow down which in turn releases the tension any stresses that you had in your body It's almost as if the parts of your body just open up, allowing the negativity out. And at the same time, replacing that negativity with positive, healing energy, which then fills your body up. And your mind to also starts to appreciate those feelings of increasing confidence and an almost uplifting feeling, positive healing. An energy that spreads through your body like a wave of comfort. And all this comes from just allowing yourself a few minutes maybe half an hour, however long you want it to be, to just rest. And allow your mind and your body to almost reset itself to the, to the settings of comfort, and relaxation, calmness, which allows more room for feelings of pleasure and happiness to move around your body and into your mind. Almost as if your mind and your body are sinking together. Almost mirroring each other with that growing positivity and calmness. And it feels nice really does feel nice to know that you are the one that has allowed yourself to feel more comfort and to experience more of this deep relaxation spreading throughout your body. And as I focus on each part of your body, 
you can notice that that part becomes even more relaxed just by focusing on it becomes even more calm and comfortable just by focusing and as I move down your body starting at your head the parts that you've already focused on will continue to relax deeply and those parts that we've not yet focused on will just automatically release any remaining tension in anticipation of even more comfort about to come now I'm going to start by focusing on your forehead just being aware of the feelings of your forehead And any background sounds like Mr. Herbert the Pigeon can just allow you to feel even more relaxed. It just means you're in the moment. This isn't this isn't a sterile environment. This is the world. I live in the countryside. So there's lots of nature sounds around. So as you focus on your forehead, just notice how it becomes even more relaxed as you focus only on my voice and that part of your body. Moving down to your eyes, focusing on your eyes, noticing how the, your eyelids feel so heavy, yet so light at the same time, and all the muscles around your eyes relaxing completely moving your focus down to your mouth your lips your tongue your teeth and your gums and the whole of your mouth relaxing Focus now on your jaw, not just the part of your jaw near your mouth, your chin, but all the way up the sides of your face to your ears, that whole of your jaw, feeling in on your neck, the front of your neck and your throat, relaxing and loose and calm, the sides of your neck, the right and left side of your neck. Focus.
focusing on the back of your neck. Letting go of any tension that may have been there before. And enjoying that sense of increasing comfort and release that you can experience in the back of your neck. Moving down your back, moving either side of your spine, right from the top of your back, all the way down to the bottom of your back. down to your lower back and as you move up and down your spine you can feel the muscles either side of your spine relaxing even more As those muscles relax, that sense of comfort starts to spread outwards from your spine into both sides of your back, the top of your back, the middle and your lower back. And as you scan Gently and slowly up and down your back as the muscles in the top of your back relax and become looser. The muscles in the middle of your back also seem to just almost divide from each other separating and almost melting. And in your lower back, there seems to be an extra special feeling of comfort. This Spreads into your hips, so down your lower back into your hips, into the area where your coccyx are, and into your buttocks. And all those muscles that spread in your lower back into your hip area, start to melt, start to really let go, and you know we're about to focus on your shoulders, your back and your spine. As you focus on your shoulders, you may notice that they're already feeling really loose. They're already feeling Yeah. 
these muscles that move from your neck into your shoulders. so soft and gentle, so smooth, and calm, and the feeling shoulders seems to spread deep into your shoulders that sense of relaxation not just traveling deeply into your muscles but also relaxing and moving all the way to underneath your arms, relaxing that whole area between the tops of your shoulders and underneath your arms, healing. so relaxed and comfortable in your shoulders, which sends that deep healing message into your You may feel almost as if your arms are not even there because they're so relaxed, so deeply relaxed. So spreading all the way down your arms to your elbows including your elbows circumference spread Focusing. 
this sense of real peace. It just seems to feel so familiar. tips to the front of your body in your thighs your knees
muscles and your shins completely start counting down now from 20 down to 1 you can imagine in a way it's like just walking down some steps and each step all 20 steps and each step represents a level of comfort each step 
represents a deepening of that comfort. And the further you, you walk down those steps, the deeper and more relaxed you feel. So, starting with number 20. Eighteen. Seventeen. Sixteen.
14. Thirteen.
eight.
as you focus on your eyes. Focus in just on your eyes, your eyelids, the muscles around your eyes, your eyeballs themselves, that whole area that makes up your eyes. As we count down from ten down to one, whilst focusing on your eyes, you will become twice as relaxed with each number counting down. you may find that all you want to do is just drift off to sleep and if that's what you want then just allow yourself to do that in on your eyes, you're going to begin counting down from ten down to one, right now, ten.
So, counting down from ten to one, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four. Three, two, one. And maybe that was a bit too quick in order to relax. Maybe it's a bit too fast for you to notice the calming of your body. Maybe even a little bit of pressure there like 
and you're counting down from ten to one. What do you expect me to do, man? You expect me just to go all floppy just because you're counting down? I could try it again, but this time I'll go a bit slower. This time I'll you focus on the whole of your body before we focus on your legs. Just notice how your body does start to feel more relaxed. With every number that I count down. Ten. Seven, six, five, four. just notice how how you feel generally how your body feels it's not necessarily even about counting down from 10 to 1 it's that space that you have that space between being active physically or mentally to just sitting or lying down just being there not doing anything not saying anything not needing to think think about anything so it, op it opens up a space you know a bit of a space a gap and the more I count down from 10 to 1 the bigger that gap becomes so there's that gap of calmness of comfort, of relaxation. It's a nice feeling. And it removes those stresses or discomforts physically or emotionally, moves them away. Allows you to just slow down. So I'm going to count again from 10 down to 1 and notice that gap widening. 
the gap. And as it widens, it's almost like the the stress and the tension falls into the gap. It gives you that distance, that space. Seven, six, How does your body feel now? Can you notice that that you're feeling calmer? Feeling more relaxed. As we now focus on your legs. Just your legs. We're just going to start with focusing on your thighs. course it's not the most exciting thing to be doing because I'm I'm sure like most of your body there's not a lot going on right now just focusing on the whole of your thighs the tops of your thighs the sides of your thighs, the bottoms of your thighs, your outer thighs and your inner thighs. Basically the whole of your thigh that leads into your hip. And then 
goes down to your knee joint. Now this is a big area. It's a very heavy area, very strong, probably the strongest muscles in your body are in your thighs. But I don't think we perhaps give enough attention to our thighs. Perhaps we don't acknowledge how important our thighs are to our lives. How much they actually do for us all through our lives. sound really weird but I think that all of our body parts especially our thighs need some TLC a bit of love shown a bit of acknowledgement a thank you gratitude for what our thighs do for us. And I know this may sound a bit strange. Maybe you think, why am I, surely I should be out in, in the garden hugging a tree or something. It's hard to set a microphone up on a tree. That's why I'm doing this indoors. Otherwise I would be outside hugging a tree. No, I can't see the television from the tree. If you move down to your knees, again, such an important part. And I think we don't necessarily... I'll speak for myself here. I don't necessarily appreciate all that my knees do for me until I have a problem with my knee. So occasionally if I have a, maybe I bash it or it's aching for some reason, it's then that I realise how much it does benefit of being able to use my legs without any kind of physical discomfort is a beautiful thing that's possibly not appreciated until it's temporarily removed, you know, that comfort. But as you focus on your knees, Regardless of how your knees feel, you can have that sense of gratitude and love to your knees for all that they do for you. And you can still have that attention on your thighs. Maybe notice how your thighs feel. Maybe you can notice that they are relaxing more deeply. And as you focus now on the bottoms of your legs, your shins, 
and the calf muscles, the bones between your knees and your feet, incorporating of course your ankles, so important. his head with even a, like the slightest sprain of an ankle knows how how much we take our ankles for granted and it's kind of strange in a way when you think that you know logically our wrists are a lot thinner than the rest of our arms which is okay doesn't can't see any problem with that because we're just picking stuff up but our ankles are so much thinner than the rest of our legs and from a physics perspective or logical even it doesn't really make sense that all this weight would ultimately be resting on your ankles then leading to your feet that thin area thin bone yet it does so much great work supports us supports our body for a lifetime Helps us to balance. Helps you to get around and be mobile. And there's the calf muscles, of course. When I was younger, I couldn't see the point in calf muscles. They didn't seem to do anything. Like, okay, if I walked around on tiptoes, then my calf muscles get some work. But of course, that's not true. The calf muscles are being used whenever we use our legs. And your shins, there to protect your lower legs. Shaped in a way almost as a protector for the bone. Leading, of course, to your ankles and your feet. But we're not going to focus on your feet, we're just going to focus on the legs. I realize now that I've mentioned your feet, you're probably focusing on them anyway. So maybe I should focus on your feet a little bit. You can have them in your awareness. The same as you have your thighs in your awareness. Even though we haven't been focusing on your thighs for a few minutes. We've been focusing on your ankles. There's still that sensation of comfort in your thighs. Almost that movement of energy. Because the thighs hold lots of different sensations. Of course, there's the muscles, the big, strong muscles that we have in our thighs. But the skin on the outside of the thighs, as in the outside of all of our body can be very sensitive. 
sensitive to the touch, sensitive to temperature. And inside your thighs, the bones, there's the muscle, there's the blood vessels, the arteries. So all this stuff is inside your thighs. And I guess sometimes it'd be nice if you could actually put your fingers inside your thighs and massage. So you can massage on the outside, of course, but to be able to get deep into the muscles, to be able to just massage inside your thighs, massage in the bones of your leg, massage in all the veins and just gently healing your thighs. move down, massaging inside your knees, just massaging those bones, but with healing fingertips, spreading that healing energy deep into the joints of your knees, and of course there's the back of your, your knee, you know the inside crease where your knee is. It's a very sensitive area. Very feels very nice when you stroke it. That might be because it's an area that's not really touched very often. It's almost like a hidden part, that crease in your legs. It's almost it's like a part that has a, a sensitivity which is a little bit different. Of course it's protected by your legs. So you can imagine putting your fingers into that crease in your legs. in between your legs, you can just massage with your fingertips, imagine your fingertips going inside, massaging the muscle tissue, you can of course feel the, the bones of your knees healing through your fingertips. as you go down to your calf muscles now that's a part I'd like to be able to really put my fingertips deep inside my calf muscles massaging every single tissue of that muscle healing same for my shins, massaging and gently stroking the bones, gently stroking them, healing in a loving way, because they deserve to be treated as the precious bones that they are, because our legs are so precious, as in all the other parts of our body. They're more precious than any jewel on the planet. Now when you start to think about your legs in this way, it can change your perspective. Sound a bit, a bit silly to start with. The idea of 
and in love for your legs, showing appreciation for your thighs, wanting to be able to put your hands in your thighs, massage the muscles in your bones, and to get your fingers deep in there, releasing all tension, just to show how much you care about your legs, how much you care for what your legs do for you regularly, your knees, your calves, your ankles. The strength of your ankles, considering how thin they are compared to the rest of your legs, especially your thighs, yet they're so strong, so flexible, absolutely amazing things your ankles are. Truly a gift because of what they do for you. Supporting all that weight, regardless of how what weight you are, even if you're only eight stone, it's still a lot of weight in these little ankles. stone, double that, yet my ankles support my body all the time, although they do give off a sigh of relief when I sit down, as in fact my whole legs do, my feet, feet also go toes clap, they're so happy, the legs really are amazing. And I know that talk, uh, talking about your legs is probably, possibly the, one of the most in, most boring things you've ever heard anyone say, possibly. But boring or not, everything I said is true. Your legs are amazing. Your legs deserve not just respect, they deserve to relax deeply. They deserve to take some time out of the day to just let go completely. Because the legs are so, such a most, you know, very important part of your body, when you relax your legs, the rest of your body also naturally follows in that journey of comfort.
feel it in my hips. My hips feel really loose. And also my lower back as well. My lower back really feels, it feels stretched. Even though I'm just sitting in a chair. And there's no stretching as far as I'm aware that I'm doing. It's almost as if the muscles are just relaxed so much that there is a natural stretch as the tension has reduced a lot. Continue to feel wonderfully relaxed. Ten, nine, eight, seven. So I'm just going to count down from five down to one. And as I count down, if you just focus on the numbers, just the numbers, counting down, and notice how you feel in this moment as you hear the numbers counting down, knowing that those numbers counting down represent you feeling calmer, not just in your body, but also relaxing your mind. And just notice how you feel. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to say. There's nothing to think about. Starting with number five. Four. As you notice the gradual letting go of the tension in your body, you may also begin to notice and be aware of how your mind is starting to slow down. This is just a natural thing that happens. It's not really a special procedure. It's just natural because as your body relaxes, your mind also starts to relax. And the more your mind relaxes, the more your body relaxes. It's just a continuous circle of relaxation. And 
and it's that calmness that comes from relative quietness. You know, even even if there's background sounds, either your side or mine, it's still going to be quite calm. You know, you haven't got the television on, there's no music in the background unless you're listening to the recording with music, of course. You're very likely not going to be sitting in a room with other people. Of course you might be, but generally it's more ideal if you can do this on your own. So, no distractions. And when you stop thinking about stuff, relaxation automatically rises. A sense of comfort starts to grow. And without trying to build it up into something fantastical or something magical, this is just a natural process, something that's easy to accomplish. In fact, it's almost you know, the sense of relaxing completely happens really when you put no effort into it. It's not something that you can really force. It's something that happens naturally and part of the process of this recording and others is simply to allow you to take advantage of this space, this time, to just let go, to just be here, to be in tune with how you feel. Yet with the intention of wanting to relax deeply. And maybe even to fall asleep depending on what it is that you wish for yourself in this moment. As we know, relaxing is the majority of the process of falling asleep. The actual falling asleep part is the tiny bit at the end, the deeper relaxed you become, the easier you find yourself drifting. You can also, if you choose, stay focused on my voice and really enjoy the process of gradually Relaxing each muscle in your body.
miss me. And just observing the sensation of letting go. This time I'm going to count from six down to one. And you can notice your mind calming down more with each number that you hear me say. slowed right down sinking deeply into relaxation As you focus on your mind, you may notice that there are some thoughts still there, maybe some stubborn thoughts that 
for some reason. Perhaps need your attention. So what you can do is send love to those thoughts. Sprinkle those thoughts with love like little petals from a flower you just sprinkle it over them petals filled with love towards those thoughts to let those thoughts know that you're not abandoning them you just need them you require them to just calm down Slow down, quiet down, for now. So as you focus on those remaining thoughts, as we count down this time from seven down to one, with each number, just imagine sprinkling those flower petals of love, kindness, gratitude over those thoughts. Which will allow them to just melt away and relax deeply. thoughts will become more and more relaxed. Starting with number seven. Now, no 
notice how relaxed you're feeling in your body. We're going to focus the more relaxed your hands are, the more relaxed your body and mind are. And as you focus on your nothing you needed to be done, there's no clenching of fists or tensing of fingers or anything like that, it's just noticing and focusing on your hands, Noticing how they feel. Because the more relaxed your hands feel, the calmer your Noticed that your mind is starting to drift. Just on your hands and fingers, allowing them to experience a real deepening of that relaxation in your hands and fingers. number from eight down to one you can almost feel that healing and relaxing energy spreading into your hands Each 
Just being here now. Nothing to think about. Nothing to do. Nothing to say. Everything just feels calmer. This is your natural state of being. This is how you just normally feel when you take away all that other stuff that we add, like all that stress and worry and overthinking and anxiety. stuff. Can you 
take that away, which is what we do, what we do now. We have here a real sense of peacefulness, which comes through very quickly. Because ultimately, it's just a feeling. It's just a feeling of comfort. It's almost as if we've gone inside yourself and we've found a special place where everything is peaceful. place where you can feel relaxed and your natural sense of comfort. A place where you can be you. Where you can accept yourself for who you are. A place where you're not trying to anybody else ever a place where you can actually not just love yourself but in some ways more importantly you can like yourself appreciate who you are sense of gratitude is in the air all around you. And that's also a place where you can actually feel the healing energy soaking into your body. soaking into your body and that healing energy spreads through your veins traveling to each and every single part of your body start to realize that actually that healing energy has not just entered into your brain, it's become part of your brain. And that spinal fluid is now mixed with healing energy. Not just allowing you to feel so much more relaxed and healthy in this moment, but also you start to realize that actually what's happening now with that healing relaxing energy spreading through your body is actually changing your life it's actually changing the way you're going to feel not just now but tomorrow and the next day as your health improves Not just your physical health, but your mental health. Things that used to bother you in the past, for some reason, no longer 
have the effect that they used to. Because something has changed deep within you. Maybe things that used to cause you to feel anger no longer have that power to control you the way they seem to be able to before because you realize that you are the one who decides what affects you. You're the one who decides to feel relaxed and calm when you choose to enjoy noticing these natural developments of healing continuing to grow and improve your life day by day. Including, of course, your ability to relax so much easier when sleeping is the most natural thing in the world to you because falling asleep is something that you've done You know that you were born, as we all were, with the ability to fall asleep naturally. You were born with that ability to just drift off into a deep human sleep. Even when we're kids, sometimes we'll fall asleep when we don't even want to. We try to <laughs> stay awake. Maybe it's a birthday in the morning or it's Christmas or a holiday or something we look forward to. We don't want to go to sleep. But the more we want to stay awake, the more we just start to drift. the more you fight drifting, the more you try and stop yourself from drifting asleep, the deeper and stronger that drifting becomes. Because we're born not just with the need to relax deeply and to naturally fall asleep. It's our birthright. It's part of our DNA. And sometimes as we get older in life, perhaps at times we have forgotten that relaxing It's not only a wonderfully pleasant experience, it's also really easy. It's very, very easy. 
person and let go. Because that's all it is, it's just deciding. Press the play button on my recordings. You have given permission for my voice to relax you. When you press that play button, you have given me permission for my words. Positive, only a positive way, opening up your mind to useful and healing suggestions. effect on how you feel right now as well as those changes that continue long after the recording ends those changes within Continue to flourish and grow, transforming your life in a positive, beautiful way, allowing you to move forward in your life in the direction that you choose yourself. And this feeling, this feeling that you can experience of safety, comfort, calmness, so nice it's such a healthy place to be and that positivity grows within you physically and in your mind is more relaxed and it's not that your thinking is slower it's just that your mind will be less clogged up with unnecessary negativity Because from now on, your mind rejects negativity. From now on, you're going to start noticing when negativity arises. You can just say stop. Stop. Negativity will turn around and leave you alone. So 
と、お前、ネガティビティ。Congratulate yourself because you're the person that has done this. You are the one that has opened your mind up to the simple facts that you can feel more relaxed in your body and in your mind. Opened your mind up to the birthright of being able to just fall asleep easily when you choose. And that's a nice feeling, don't you think? Feels nice, doesn't it? To feel calm, all that healing energy spreading through your body and your mind. To spend time in that, that special place where negativity. Negativity is banned, it's barred, it's not allowed entry. Doesn't, it doesn't, des- doesn't deserve to be here, doesn't belong here. Negativity has no place in your life. Room for more comfort, more healing, more relaxation, more peace. Doesn't it? To just let go of everything. And I'm going to count down now from twenty down to one. Continue to relax. If you choose, you can drift to sleep. With every number, you hear me say, you can feel twice as relaxed. If you choose, you can feel twice as sleepy. For now, twenty.
is your time to just take a break. Your time to relax, to allow your mind to slow down. Give yourself permission to take a break from everything and you're the only person that can make that decision. You're the only person that can actually tell your mind Just relax. To just take some time off. So that you can focus on your body getting in touch with you feel physically and in the process of this body scan where you focus on different parts of your body those focus on and observe, even though you're not purposely requesting for those parts of your body to relax, it's kind of expected, we expect when we listen to our voice to feel more relaxed naturally. Because when you're listening to me, your attention is focused on my words. And as my words guide you to focus focus increases which actually calms your mind and when your mind calms down And when your body calms down, your mind relaxes. on your body, you can already feel that healing energy spreading through your body, pushing out Inside your body, all of them are 
Jesus will protect all and everything as he is heir in your body and is filled with that healing energy. relaxation increases deeply increases in a way that your mind starts to feel perhaps a bit drowsy because it's not needed and your mind starts to relax listening to this and what you need is deep relaxation that's what you'll get if what you need is a full sleep naturally and easily as your mind drifts that's also by pressing that play button on the podcast and listening to me, you give permission to your body and your mind. In fact, you give the command to your body I focus on the different parts of your body, you may start to just drift and then come back again and begin talking and and focusing on different parts of your body. yourself drifting, but you don't realize you're drifting until you stop drifting, and you get immersed again in my voice, focusing on a different part of your body, that drifting is basically you already in the sleep zone. And the more you drift, the longer you drift, and the longer you drift, and eventually that drifting continues to sleep. And that's the last you remember 
let's focus again on parts of your body. Focusing this time on your forehead. Focusing on your fingers. Maybe you like to move your fingers a little bit so you can focus on each one individually. focus on both of your hands now and then you'll see it's just melt into one where does your right hand start and your left hand end and ask as if Focusing on your knees. Just noticing how your knees feel. Now focusing on your elbows. Focusing on both of your elbows. 
letting go. start now and I'd like you just firstly just to see yourself lying down on that massage table lying on your front your head is supported your arms are supported and you feel comfortable and breathing is really easy and you feel You feel confident in how you look as well, so there's none of that issue of body problems or shyness because I'm a professional and this is a therapy session, so none of that stuff matters whatsoever. This is about you. This is about how you feel and how you can enjoy that sense of comfort and relaxation that comes from letting go and allowing my hands and my fingers to relax you by massaging your body. So I want to start off just by placing my hands on the back of your head, just gently, just so you can feel what my hands feel like really on you, so you can maybe feel the warmth of my hands on the back of your head, I want to move my hands to the side of your head, not pressing but just holding them there very gently, maybe over your ears and a little bit on your face, just so you can feel my hands, so you can become accustomed to them. And now put my hands on the back of your head again and gently let them slide down onto the back of your neck. You can feel my hands gently stroking the back of your neck to start with. Just so you can get used to the, the feeling of my hands on your skin. Get accustomed to it. Realise that you're safe. And it's all good. It's all fine. And I'm going to start gently massaging the muscles in the back of your neck. Now 
And this is a very trusting situation, really, because our necks are so fragile. And to have someone have their hands around your neck in that way can sometimes be problematic for people. Which is why massages are quite good. Because it allows you to relax and to get in touch with trust. To feel peaceful and calm. As I massage the sides of your neck gently, moving from the bottom of your neck, which would be sort of near where your shoulders start, I guess, all the way up to your jaw, your ears kind of area, that side of your neck, of course, is a lot longer than the front of your neck. And then massaging the, the back of your neck. Especially that area where perhaps we hold tension. And as that area is massaged, you can actually feel a sense of release in the back of your neck. And maybe you can breathe it out as well. Notice how it feels. Notice how you feel. Then moving down to that area between your neck and your shoulders, that muscly area, starting to massage that area on both sides. I mean, this would be the area that a lot of people would massage if they were going to give you like a shoulder massage, even that's not technically the shoulders but it's all the muscles that lead to the shoulders and the neck. And again, that can hold tension and stress. And when massaged, sometimes a nice deep massage is useful. And you decide how deep that massage is. just to dig in to get to those muscles and to really relax them all the time being firm yet gentle with you Just stroking down that area to your actual shoulders, moving to the muscles of your shoulders. And maybe initially just pulling up the shoulders a little bit off the table, just to give you a little bit of a stretch, but very gently. the muscles at the front of your shoulders, the sides and the back. Again, this is a part that can really take quite a bit of pressure, quite a bit of uh, kneading, if, if you wish, to really the tension, really get into 
to those muscles and let your fingers in there and feel really nice. Sometimes just being stroked gently or being massaged quite strongly can all be beneficial for your relaxation. the muscles in your shoulders. And now we move down your arms. We do one arm at a time, starting with your right arm. do is I'll just lift your arm up, just hold it to the side of you, that way it'll still be attached, and I'll just massage the tops of your arms, all the way down to your forearms, into your wrists. Gently massaging that part, the softer part, which is the under part of the arm. leads to the crease in your elbow, the inside, it's much more sensitive skin. Sometimes just having that stroked can feel really nice, pleasurable and relaxing. Holding your hand in both of my hands. Just pressing gently on the back of your hand and stretching your fingers ever so lightly. At the same time, pressing down and massaging each finger. And then starting to massage the palms of your hands. Just turning the hand gently, stretching it gently. Actually having your hand held can really be an emotional experience sometimes, even if it is with a stranger, someone you don't know very well, like a massage person or a therapist maybe, because it's intimate. safe. And as I put that right arm back down where it was, I'm going to do the same with your left arm. Exactly the same. Massaging the muscles 
you are really down to your wrist. Stroke of the inside of your arm. Just being gentle or as firm as you require. And then massaging your left hand. Stretching the fingers gently. Massaging the palm of your left hand. Just rest your left arm back down. And start to massage your back. The biggest part of your body. Starting at the top. Starting again with a really big beam. Shoulders and then your neck, going back, massaging that area again, but this time moving downwards. Making a downward stroke to the middle of your back, working from the outside. Massaging the, your back, but the, the outsides of your back. The parts where your arms would maybe rest against. your front to your back. And just massaging down firmly but gently as firm as you want. Moving down or moving across a little bit and moving all the way down again very gentle, yet firm as you choose. And eventually you get to the spine. You can massage the muscles on either side of your spine, from the top of your neck all the way down to your lower back. do that a few times. Sometimes people use the knuckle or the, you know, two fingers and just go either side of the spine and must just push down, go all the way down to the bottom of the spine. Each time releasing tension opening up your body, stretching your body, so that you feel more relaxed, but at the same time, rejuvenated. And now I'm going to move to one 
one side to the right side. And from the bottom of your ribs to your pelvis, you're going to massage that area of your back. I'll stretch over the other side and I will pull the muscles gently and massage and push from one end that side all the way to my side, to the middle in fact, to where your spine is. Massaging that side of your spine, the opposite side to where I'm standing. It's almost like kneading bread. There's that big area which is firm, yeah, a lot's there to massage. Potentially one of the most important places to actually have a massage because you really feel there. You really feel the release and the pleasure of having your lower back massaged. It releases so much from your body that's not useful. Starting a healing process, which will continue long after this recording is over. Massaging this part of your body not only feels really good for you, it's actually fun to do. Because it is, as I said, like kneading bread. It's a part that you can really get a hold of and really massage deeply, if that's your choice. And then you're going to move over to the other side of your body and do the same with the opposite part. Kneading and massaging from the sides all the way to the middle of your back where your spine is. Pressing and kneading. Firm and gentle at the same time. But it feels so releasing. This mixture of pleasure, comfort, release, calmness, relaxation, all mixed together. Plus there's that feeling from your stomach as it's being stretched. Even though you're in your stomach now, you can feel it being stretched because that whole area is connected to your stomach. Now we're going to move, we'll move further up to the top of your body and I'm going to do the same. This time starting with your upper back, put my hands forward over massage in that area up to your spine from the side of your body up to your spine so some of that massage area with muscle tissue um, or whatever fatty tissue even will be possibly from your chest so it's all connected to your chest and your back so they're all together You're going to be massaging and just pulling some of that skin from your side up. And massaging that area of your upper back all the way to your spine. And then I'll move 
it down a bit and I continue at the middle of your back doing exactly the same thing. As gentle or as deep as you choose. Now I'll move up the other side again and do the exact same thing with the top of your back on the other side from me. Pretty much underneath your arm area, really. To your spine. And then continuing that all the way down, including your lower, your middle of your back. to your thighs, the backs of your thighs, and the sides of your thighs, starting with your right leg, massaging the back and the sides of your thighs, gently and firmly. There's a lot of muscles there. It's an area that can be very tense at times and maybe needs a little bit more pressure than the rest of the body. But that's up to you. You can gently stroke the back of your legs where they're opposite your knee joint or underneath your knee joint very sensitive, gentle area. Then working down to your calf muscles, massaging your calf muscles thoroughly and deeply if you choose. Using both digging deep to your ankles and the back of your back of your ankles just gently massaging that area maybe lifting the leg stretching it a little bit. Moving to the right foot. Massaging the bottom of your feet. sides of your feet, gently but firm enough so they don't tickle, and just allow the pleasure that you get from having your feet massaged to just overtake you. As I continue to massage your feet, the bottoms of your feet, your sides, your arches, your heel, and if you put a lot of pressure into your heel, then it feels amazing, yet the arches need to be a bit more gentle. Stretching your toes gently, massaging the bottoms of your toes 
of my fingers and each one individually. I'm going to move them over to the left leg to do exactly the same thing. Starting at the top of the thighs working the back of the thighs and the sides, massaging deeply and gently that whole area, working all the way down, and this is an area that maybe you could like to spend more time relaxing and massaging. So perhaps if you wanted I could make a future recording one spend more time in one particular area. As you move down to your calf muscles. Massaging your calf muscles firmly and gently. Moving them down to your ankle and into your feet. Massaging the backs of your feet, the bottoms of your feet. Stretching your toes and massaging each toe individually. And that feeling of pleasure, of release that you experience from having your feet massaged. Feel beautiful. going to start again at your neck area. Then your shoulders. Just to get back in touch with that area. As you move up fresh, because now I'm going to massage your face gently, starting off with your forehead, if your eyes are closed and you can just stretch your eyes a little bit, pushing up on your eyebrows. Massaging around your scalp. Massaging down your cheeks, around your ears, into your jaw, gently. The sides of your neck. moving down from your neck down to your chest, starting by massaging the very top of your chest, where the collarbone is, through your 
side of the collarbone. And we're just massaging the whole of the chest. chest around it gives us quite a large area as we move from one side to the next moving of the head underneath the much where your arms are some of the muscles of your back in the process. Moving up over your chest. And moving down again. Just massage gently and slide down towards your stomach, starting in the middle of your chest. And then gradually the hands moving apart, massaging and sliding at the same time. Just below your rib cage. Moving down and massaging up again. Giving your chest all the attention that it needs to feel. going to be focusing on your sides as well, an area that really doesn't get much attention, but feels really good in its massage, just striking my hands down the sides of your body, and just below your arms, all the way down to your hips. Now, moving to your stomach area. I'm going to stand one side of you, like I did when I did your lower back. I'm going to do a similar process of just stretching the muscles in your side gently massaging from one side to the next moving that whole area from below your ribs all the way down to below your belly button to the other side of you and repeat that. Process of relaxing deeply calmly feeling loose and feel free. There's something about having your stomach massaged it's different from any other part. You, you do have a tendency of holding a different kind of stress in your stomachs that you may not be aware of. So now I'm 
massage your stomach, the front of your stomach, making circles around your belly button. gentleness and a freedom that comes from feeling how you're feeling. As I now move down the tops of your thighs, the muscles, massaging them, I can do this for two legs at the same time, pressing down Massaging deeper those muscles in the thighs, the front of your thighs. Moving down to your knees, gently massaging the knees. Sliding down your shins, put the pressure on either side of your shin. Gently, softly, but firmly, moving down to your ankles, stroking the tops of your feet, and then with each foot massaging the whole of the foot, the top, the bottom, the heel, the ankle, the toes, massaging every part of your feet, feels so good just to let go and enjoy the process. So many feelings that come just from touching your skin. And you can just lie there as long as you choose, enjoying. do is blow out some candles and rewind. So we're going to be a hundred going to blow each one out individually, one by one, starting at a hundred as I count down. of you, and I'd like you 
to actually physically generally blow that candle out. Just this is not a big blow, it's just a gentle say the next number as we move down and you can just blow that one out as well and as we move down the numbers the fire in just so even more and more relaxed and you moved to sleep you also find yourself becoming incredibly tired and sleepy in fact you may struggle sounds for the moment but if you may start to just not even notice them at all because they're the sounds of the birds as Horace the pigeon likes to say hello sometimes and as your plane goes by the traffic and trains in the distance seems important whatsoever and the more candles you blow out the less important anything is the more candles you blow out further you seem to 
Sensing it. So simple. Now we're going to start by introducing the first. Activity grow within you. Relaxation, sleepiness, expanding.
thoughts, worries, concerns about the past, thoughts about the future, and even things you've been thinking about today. Just let it all go. Because none of it is useless in this moment. This is your opportunity to just focus on feeling relaxed, allowing yourself to get in touch with that natural sense of peace. That we all have within us. It's available for everyone. It just sometimes takes a little bit of effort to set up the right time and place in order for you to just let go. Because when you do decide to let go and relax, what your body starts to do because you've chosen you've chosen to just allow your body to unwind and your mind starts to slow down and it's a nice feeling it's a nice feeling at the beginning just to know that you have chosen to decide to relax deeply and because you've made that decision your body will just follow suit because sometimes all the muscles in your body need is just permission from you to relax because so often we're busy, we're going from here to there, we're walking around and we're doing stuff. And the body doesn't have any time or space to really relax deeply. So it kind of waits for you to lead the way. Waits for your permission. do give your permission and you could just say so you can say oh no it's time for your body to let go completely and relax totally your body just follows end of a day, a very physical day that you may experience in the past, or you get home and you just sit down in a chair, maybe you kick your shoes off and oh man, it feels so nice, knowing that you don't have to get up again for whatever hour it is, and if you choose you can just sit there for maybe an hour. Feels blissful. And just by sitting there right now, your body knows that it's time to relax. Your body has been given permission from you because it's a mindset. Gradually 
is that sense of relaxation in the body. It's a very natural state. It's not something unusual. It might feel unusual when you first start to relax if you if you haven't really spent a lot of time focusing and giving yourself this space to let go and to resolve and relax it might seem all nice sailing but it isn't it's actually the most natural thing in the world to let go completely to relax totally the most natural thing almost like a literal unwinding. It's like you press a button and all the tension just releases. It's like a wheel, like a cog, like the inside of a clock just unwinding. You know, it's almost like if you could see the, the little wind-up knob that's used just going the opposite way that you do to wind it up. And the energy, that frenetic, stressful energy gradually winding down, losing its power, losing its strength. There's a sense of relaxation becoming stronger and deeper. stop listening to me for a while and your mind goes somewhere else and then you really let me listen to you again and then just your mind drifting to sleep which is quite natural because sometimes when we're stressed actually do a real effort in there, it is physical, emotional, and in this moment, but more and more, your body and mind relax completely, and you let go of all thoughts, concerns, worries, and doubts, all feels in a way to be in touch with the calmness of the different body parts as well becoming looser and looser even your breathing seems easier and more natural Breathing out any excess of mind tension or stress from every part of your body and mind. And you just start to focus. 
listening, focusing on firstly how you feel in your body, not trying to change how you feel, not trying to relax, not trying to move away from the discomfort or stress or tension, just accepting, observing and accepting how you feel in the different parts of your body, just allowing yourself to be exactly you are and notice if there's any touch with how you actually feel in this moment and then start off by focusing to move your hands around, just maybe they get folded a little bit, and upon closing your hands very gently, just so that you can get in touch with how your hands and your fingers feel. Just be kind of an equivalent with your three feet of just staying with your hands and then turning your ankles, moving your feet around, making your hands gentler. Focusing now on your eyes. I invite you to just focus on your eyelids. Maybe you can open and close your eyes a couple of times and really get in touch with how you feel when you do close your eyes. The muscles. Really get in touch with the inner aspects of how your eyes feel right now. Now focusing on your thighs. sensation of your upper legs, the front of your thighs and the backs of your thighs. And noticing and observing how your thighs feel right now.
Breathe. 
starts to slow down. Including the thoughts in your mind and your mind itself. It doesn't have to be instant, but just gradually starting to, it's almost like time is stretching, but it's a slower pace to maybe what you're used to in your day-to-day -day life. It's a slower movements, the dreary sequence, and when you move your hand, it might seem like it's one movement, but it's lots of minute different muscles moving in accordance with each other. those smaller movements. Starting to focus on how your body feels. Not just as a whole. Not just, oh, I'm feeling this way. I'm feeling stressed or tense or way I'm feeling that way. Starting to notice that your body begins to present to you small feelings around your body. sensations around whether pleasurable or not and maybe resisting the temptation to label them or to judge them those feelings about them as just being neutral, just feelings, not being particularly concerned, but just noticing what your body Instead of feeling the whole of the arm, maybe notice those individual feelings and those different muscles and the skin, the hairs around the maybe internal parts of the arm as well. Thank you. 
breathing may be your left wrist also has the same individual physical sensation. forearm and the right arm, your right forearm, there may not be any particular feeling that you could even give a name to, it may not feel like anything other than just it's there. The feelings in your shoulders. Perhaps your shoulders, when you think about them, kind of almost like they're the same, you know, the same feeling. You know, kind of the both of your shoulders were just one thing. Very similar. shoulder and then on your right shoulder you may be find that you move the muscles a little bit you can tense the muscles gently noticing the difference Soft connection to your buttocks and to your hips. There's also a movement of most of the neck of your back. And sometimes focus on your calves, I'm going to focus on the buttocks, I'm going to focus on the middle of your back, it almost felt like the muscles in your lower back were being stretched very gently, just like a little bit, even though I wasn't feeling seemed to happen, the feeling of very gently stretching your lower back. And there's a lot of chest, just noticing what sensations you are experiencing in your chest right now. of the chest, you can see there's the collarbone 
see on my chest. Of course, what we do know is possibly the breasts. The male has got the different of the chest, a bit of the side underneath, pretty much the same, can be a male or a woman, got the muscles there, muscles that stretch out to your back, that's where your breast tissue stretches and moves into your back. on my chest. I feel it in my in my back, my upper back. And I guess the obvious reason would be after my breathing. Yeah. When it stretches my chest and my back at the same time. okay. Doesn't feel a little bit of pain in my right chest. A little bit, not pain, but a little discomfort, maybe stiffness possibly. I don't know. Shoulders are also wishing to flex for some reason. I can't fully part of my upper back. That connection between my shoulders and my upper back. Just move my shoulders and stretch the muscles in my back. Shoulders backwards or up, which then moves the maybe it's the stuffiness in the back. Feels quite nice actually. If you come about this, if you can. If you want to, you can have lights or skid marks for various muscles in your body that are harder to get to make a sense of how they feel.